Hey guys, what's up? Alec Torelli here, and welcome back to this special episode where I'm bringing to you a recording I did with Evan Jarvis, otherwise known as Gripst, on a podcast where he was kind enough to bring me on his all-in podcast, and we talk about all things poker, how I got started on my journey, some of the lessons I've learned in the past 15 years playing high-stakes poker and traveling around for that. Uh, Just some of the struggles along the way, how I overcame them, uh, coaching, my journey with Conscious Poker, uh, some of the stories from the big games uh, that I played in Macau, and much, much more. This is an awesome episode. It's all timestamped down below, so you can scroll through and find exactly what you're looking for. And for more on Evan, highly recommend you check him out. He's been producing content on YouTube since 2008. That is seriously next level. Uh, check him out at youtube.com slash gripst or gripst.com for poker training. There's some awesome stuff is there as well. Again, all in the show notes. Without further ado, I bring you my uh, wide-ranging podcast with Evan Jarvis. Thanks. All right. What's up, everybody? Uh, Evan Jarvis here for Gripst Poker Training. And uh, welcome to the live stream of the first ever live episode of the All In Poker podcast. Normally we do these pre-recorded, but Alec came up with the idea of doing it live. So uh, today my guest on the All In Poker podcast is pro poker player, keynote speaker, entrepreneur, and founder of Conscious Poker, Mr. Alec Torelli, who is coming fresh in off a $20,000 win on Live at the Bike and some epic travels on the West Coast as well, because that's how he rolls. Alec, how you doing, brother? Great, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the flattering intro. Uh, excited to be here. And uh, obviously been keeping up with your content for a long time. We've chatted a lot a lot off the off the record just personally, too. So it's it's long overdue that we get uh, some time in like this. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking, man. Um, I, I was looking through the old emails uh, that we had, and I see it's been about two years since since we first talked about doing this. And I'm like, do you want to do this? Crazy. You said 100%, I'm down. And then I just, I didn't get back to you because I just went yeah. off on some silly tangent. <laughs> both of us, man, that's life, you know? So, well, I'm glad we both made time. So this is, this is going to be great. Yeah. So uh, I want to, I want to have the viewers get to know you and your story a little bit better. So if we can roll it back all the way to the beginning, can you talk about what your first few experiences were like with poker? Yeah, I, well, so my family played poker on holidays, like Thanksgiving and Christmas. And we did play Texas Hold'em. It was in the rotation, but it but was by no means as prominent as it is today. This was, you know, in the 90s. And um, we also played a myriad of other games. We played like everything, like one-eyed jacks in the hole are wild, like anything, right? Um, and that was a lot of fun. So I, I was infatuated with cards from a young age and it, it felt kind of natural when Texas Hold'em came around that I was like, you know, oh, I like poker. I play cards with my family. I kind of had this affinity for it already. And so... I got invited to a friend's house one day. I was 16. Moneymaker just won the main event. And he's like, can you, do you want to come play poker? It's, you know, five or $10 buy-in. Uh, we'll have pizza and whatever. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. I was like, sure. I went over to his house. I won $12 my first time playing. And as they say of any gambler, you know, the worst thing that could happen is you win your first time because then you're hooked. <laughs> and so that was really what it was for me. Like I won and I was just like, this is amazing. I was right at that perfect age where everyone else was getting a job. And I was like, oh my gosh, I made money doing something I love playing poker. And I immediately was like, what if I can just have fun playing poker and make some money? Like, I just want to play as much as possible. I wasn't thinking about, I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily thinking that like a business plan, but I was just like, oh, I won $12. This is awesome. Let me keep doing this. And so I would keep playing. We, I would start to play in home games. Uh, you know, eventually we were playing, you know, three days, four days a week, we would play, you know, very quickly would play all our weekends, like 10, 12 hours a day on weekends with friends. And I was like winning, you know, I was, I was not the best player, but I was, you know, quickly amongst the best players. And, you know, I read a book, I read play poker, like the pros and just started playing a lot of home games. And that really like kickstarted my poker career. I took it very seriously from a young age. I would have, you know, strategy calls with friends where we'd talk poker strategy for hours. Um, And I, I read, absorbed and played and thought about poker all the time. Okay. So in addition to it being kind of an exciting way to make money, uh, I know that same feeling. That's what I had right away where I'm just like, amazing. I play a game 
and I get to make money, two of my favorite things. Did you also find it was like a really good social outlet for you, like a setting where you actually felt really comfortable and you really vibed with all the people you were, you know, playing with? Yeah, that's a great observation. And I was never, you know, a jock in high school. I was like, I kind of got along with everyone and I was cool with everyone. Um, that's just sort of my personality, but I was never like, you know, the star football player. Like I was in musical theater, um, I was in choir. And like, you know, this was something where like all of the people were equals, right? It wasn't like, oh, there's this guy on the basketball court and then there's this guy on the football stadium. It was like at the poker table, everyone's equal, right? So you're playing poker with all these people that you would normally not socialize with. And then you could also beat them. So like in that moment, you know, I was in my element because I was cooler than them. And they like, you know, sometimes they couldn't beat me. And I like, you know, would win against these players that in any other capacity in high school, they were like, you know, in a cooler crowd or they were better than me at sports or, or whatever it was. And so there was also that element where like, I found something that like I could shine at. And that was very cool um, to me uh, coming from, you know, my background. It's, 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 it's a little, uh, a little more niche. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you mean. I also spent some time in theater. I spent some time in band. I did a lot of gaming in high school. Yeah. I was trying to figure out my way and those weren't the most like, popular cool things and when i first found poker in university and started winning at it i'm like wow finally something that i really feel good about myself with and that i can build my self-confidence with because here's the thing i've been playing cards and games since i was young finally a game that's cool finally a game that's kind of mainstream um and yeah it's, it's just beautiful how poker kind of filled that gap for people like yourself and me and i'm sure a lot of people who are tuning in today yeah that's cool we have similar backgrounds too i didn't know you were in theater and band and yeah, yeah it's 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 totally different um but it, it, yeah it, it it is really cool and also poker is so exhilarating when you win you know it's just like there's so many elements that make it captivating for someone in their formative years oh yeah it's it's such a rush it's it's it was a better high than any of the drugs that i got exposed to um and it was <laughs> like okay i'm making money so i'm doing something good like i'm getting a rush but it's for something that's accepted by society so that's good um so talking a little bit about online poker what was it like when you transitioned from live to online because i remember you know you were a pretty prominent player on full tilt back when it all started yeah well i got started on party poker and i started playing there in high school and i was winning like quite a bit so i had one day after school that you know sort of went down at, at the school where I, I bought into this $30 tournament and it, I, we started at like I don't know 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. or whatever and I, I played until 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. or whatever and I won and it was like 2500 or 2250 something like that which you know for a kid in high school was like I was the richest person in the world yeah you know so there, there were moments like that where I had these like boosts and these kickstarts and these things that went really well for me that you know reinforced my love and and motivation to keep playing poker i also had a week where i was playing one two and i had a bet with a friend that i could win three grand in a week playing one two and i was very structural about it i broke it down like okay i need to win you know 600 and whatever dollars a day i'm gonna play this many days a week i need to play this many hours i'm gonna play four tables and like i quit every day when i won that amount mm -hmm. um and i did it and so like there, so like there were these times when i would have these surges of um, growth in, in poker, you know, at a very young age. And so that was, that was awesome. Um, I did well in some tournaments online too, where we cashed for a lot that, you know, the Sunday million, I don't think it was called the Sunday million then, but whatever, but, um, yeah, I was doing that. And then I think, you know, by the end of high school, I was playing, I want to say three, six and five, 10 online. I actually remember when the biggest game on party poker was two, four, uh, or one, two, it was either one, two or two, four. And then there was a day that they opened either two, four or three, six and five, 10. And I remember we ditched school that day and went to the internet cafe and played online poker. And so there was like, oh my God, there's all these new games. There's all these new tables. Uh, we were already beating the biggest games online at the time. And I remember we jumped in those biggest games, probably not doing the best bankroll management, but a friend and I, we kind of took a shot. Um, and like we were winning in those games in high school. And so we were making quite a lot of money quite a bit of money excuse me and uh that was that was incredible yeah you know just that that really compelled me to keep playing keep working hard never to get a job 
uh, and just try and make poker work all the time. And then when I went to college, uh, I was 18, that was 2005, um, you know, poker was still totally booming online and I would just continue to play online. I, I did well in some online tournaments. Um, and uh, it was really when I didn't get started with, I was playing on full tilt a bit at the time, but I really, things really shifted to full tilt for me a lot more when I was, I think it was 18 or 19. I moved down to Australia. I dropped out of college, um, had like 30, 30 K or something like that. I couldn't play in the U S and I wanted to compete overseas and in, in live tournaments. And so I went to Australia. I ended up loving it so much. I lived there for three months uh, or I stayed there for six months, excuse me. And I got up at four in the morning one day to play the F tops, which was then the biggest tournament in, in history. Uh, and I, you know, 16 hours later, I I won for over a quarter million dollars in a single day. Um, and so that gave me a huge bankroll. And at the time I was playing like 510 and 1020, but I moved up to 2550 uh, on party poker. And that was the biggest game. And I, I just, I really crushed that game. I did very, very well uh, then. And, I, and then I slowly moved up to the biggest games on full tilt that year in 2007, uh, and I, I won over a million dollars in cash games on full tilt alone in, tw- in 2007. So that really, wow. you know, sort of put me on the map in, in, in the poker world and really gave me the, the bankroll to then go play all the big live games and, and travel the world full time and, and, and play all the events I wanted to. Yeah, that's amazing. Because I remember seeing you sitting the 200, 400 games and just being like, wow. Yeah, that was guy- during that time. Yeah, and, and I didn't know you had the cash game background. I'm like, this guy won a tournament, and I was just going to sit these games because I'd seen some other tournament players go and do that. But you had the cash game background that gave you the confidence to play heads up. Yeah, I was always a cash game player. Yeah, that was amazing to me because I had the F-Tops jersey. Yeah. And it was this jersey you got if you won one of their major tournaments, you get this jersey. And so there weren't that many events at the time. So I got this gold jersey. And that was my avatar and you couldn't change it. And I was kind of like, I, you know, I didn't really want this jersey as my avatar. I kind of wanted the other one where I can do the emojis and like have the face go happy when I won and sad when I lost. But like I realized that I got so much action because I had this jersey. Because People would see the jersey, then they would look me up and they'd be like, oh my God, this guy won a quarter million dollars in a tournament. He has no idea what he's doing in cash games. Whereas I was always a cash game player. Like I made all my money playing high stakes cash games or, or low stakes at, at the time. But the bigger cash games that were online uh, was I was kind of always underground, but that's always how I made my money. So like I was really confident in the cash games. Um, I shifted over to heads up because it was faster paced. It was easier to get action. And frankly, if you have an edge over someone heads up, like there's no variables, you're just going to crush. And so I became quickly specialized in heads up uh, and I just got so much action and I, I was on top of the game for a while there. Nice, man. Nice. And it sounds like you had you had a good crew coming up that kind of supported you in the growth. You were saying, you know, like we were crushing it, we were doing it. Can you maybe mention three of the key poker mentors you had along the way and maybe one lesson they each gave you in this really kind of formative stage of your career? Uh, sure. Uh, Tom Dwan. Uh, I met him in the Bahamas when I, you know, I, I think the first live tournament I went to, I think it was 2005. Uh, he was playing high stakes on party poker at the time with a guy named LOL tricked you. He was like another legend that was playing high stakes games at the time. And I just got to watch um play in a six max game against this guy. And, and there were just plays he was making that like, you know, were just so like seemingly crazy and outside the box. And I, like they were doing things like three betting and four betting and like that sounds so normal today but like nobody three bet ever in those games like there was just no three betting and they were like three betting and four betting you know and they were doing it with like marginal hands for like it was just so far ahead of what was going on and so just watching him play and talking poker with him we also went to rome together in uh in new york city together uh we traveled together and stayed together in 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 those cities so we, we did some traveling around the world together too and that was 2007 something like that so just coming up with him and talking a lot of poker and watching him play, um, playing online, stuff like that together, uh, really just shaped the way I thought and allowed me to be more creative and think outside the box. Um, of course, we've, we've since played a lot together in, in the big games in Macau, which we can get we can get to later. Yeah. Um, 
but that, that that was like really you know creative influence uh another really close friend i've had for the past I don't know, 15 years is andrew roble uh he played under good to see you online obviously one of the most successful people in poker today um and i, I met him in aruba uh in 2006 maybe i ended up getting eighth in that tournament um and and, and we both hung around for a couple days afterwards and um you know, became good friends after that. And uh, we've lived together, we've traveled together and and been close for the, you know, the whole, the whole time. Uh, just like very smart, very disciplined, very successful. I uh, respect Andrew a lot. Obviously, I think one of the best players. And I learned a lot from him about like, just the habits of a poker player, like how to be a, not just better at playing poker, but also just how to manage yourself better. Uh, think about, the business of poker better and those sorts of things. So the, the, the those two people were very influential. Uh, and then there was a host of other ones, people that, you know, might, might not know as well, but that I, I'd like to think that everyone that I came across on my journey, I'd learned something from like, for example, I had another friend named Dane who was a couple of years older than me. I was always kind of the youngest. So I always hung out with older people and I always had a lot to learn from them because they were always, you know, much more experienced and mature. And especially at a young age, like eight, 18, 19, the difference between 18 and 23 is like massive, right? I mean, there's yeah. five years of adult life, you know, it's like 25% older than you, you know? So uh, I had a lot to learn from them. And he was running a online poker business. He was actually uh, one of the biggest affiliates for party poker. So he was making money by signing people up to play on party poker, mm -hmm. basically took me under his wing and I became his sub affiliate. So I was the person underneath him and he taught me everything he knew. And I also quickly became one of the bigger affiliates on party poker i was making i think before the, the the ban of party poker in the us i was making like 30 30k a month the biggest month um and signing people up to play on party poker so like there's there's so many people that i learned different things from like i learned business from him um and i learned that whole aspect of poker uh that i never would have learned so there were a lot of people on my journey those are just three examples uh and there's so many more people i lived with a guy named mike uh, Justin, I mean, there's just so many other people that I learned so many things from, but yeah, it yeah. sounds like your, your willingness to go for it and the fact that you just really committed to the poker lifestyle and becoming the best player that you can be kind of got you aligned with these other people and your, your social skills and your willingness to learn and your openness gave you the opportunity to get really close to these guys who, you know, we're, we're happy to share that stuff with someone who was on the same path as them, but otherwise, you know, they weren't putting that info out in the public kind of thing. And I like to think they had stuff to learn from me too, where, you know, we're doing like, I may be sharing poker strategy or we're like talking. And so there's this collaborative effort of back and forth where, you know, you're, you're learning from each other. And I think that makes everybody better. So um, it's good stuff. Yeah, I think there's an amazing thing too when we kind of get back, get past those initial stages where we're not sure, we got to feel people out, got to decide if we can trust them, what we can share. And eventually, like when you're just friends with people and you're just cool with people and comfortable with people, suddenly you can fully be yourself. You can share everything you have to offer and they feel they can do the same. And that's when that, that synergy and that massive growth really comes into the picture. And I feel like that's one of the benefits that, you know, only comes when you actually go and spend time with people face to face in person, like do these experiences beyond just chatting in a forum or chatting on an instant messaging program and really, you know, share life experience. Um, yeah. Like there's no way that I would have had any of the growth or, or success or knowledge I, I, I would have had if I didn't fully commit to the lifestyle and, and connecting with these people in person. It's, it's really all about who, you know, even in a, in, a, in an individual game like poker where you're like, Oh, you know, I could just do this on my own and play poker. Like there's absolutely, I'm like, I'm so convinced there's absolutely no chance I would have made it where I was if I didn't literally live with the people that I mentioned and, and many more and, and travel around to live events and, and connect with people. And like all the things I got to do in person were so defining for me. And uh, that was really important. And I actually did go out of my way to like connect with other people in the poker industry. So for example, one of the guys that ended up living with me, we actually were roommates years later. Uh, we, we became very close friends. Um, 
I met him playing poker on a table, right? So we played against each other in like a 2-4 cash game. Yeah. We probably started talking because we were just talking trash to each other because that's what you do when you're 18 playing online poker. Yeah. And then we exchanged screen names. We started talking on AOL Instant Messenger. And then we started sharing strategy because it was like, oh, hey, I played this hand. What do you think? And then we just kind of became friends. And then when I went out to Australia, like he had dropped out of college too. And it was like, hey, you want to come out to Australia and meet me and like stay with me and my other friend for three weeks. And so he literally show, showed up on my doorstep in Australia. I had never been to Australia before. This was before the like internet smartphone era. So like I literally, he sent me a picture of him on AIM and I gave him an address of an apartment in Sydney, which I've never been to. I had no idea like about anything. And literally we both showed up on the same day at the same time. And then we ended up living together and traveling the world together for like five years after that. Uh, but, but that's like a real story that happened from like a guy that I had literally never met before it's from Chicago. And like we were playing together at a two, four cash game on party poker. And then we ended up having that experience together, like and him, him and another friend of mine, we all lived together and traveled together and grew up in poker together. Uh, and then we made each other a lot better. I actually learned quite a bit about poker from him, too, because he was always studying and, and very far ahead of the curve. Uh, very smart guy. So, I mean, there's some crazy stories like that, too, where I just would do these random things and then have these random experiences. But then I made great friends because of it. You know, the internet is crazy. Yeah. And, and I know like myself, I had the most growth when I lived with other poker players and totally. I limited myself in a lot of ways because I was very shy. I was very insecure about a lot of things. So I didn't go for it. I didn't put myself out there as much until I was kind of forced to. So I'm kind of curious, um, for you know the younger me and the younger me's out there, how did you develop this this mindset and this willingness to just to just be free and just just go for it and and get out there and you know have have trust and faith that it's just all going to work out? I actually don't think I, this is probably a slightly frustrating answer, but I, I actually don't think that this is anything I could really take credit for, and and that uh, it's just something that I think I was given by mainly my mom that yeah. instilled an extreme amount of like just confidence and um, like, like just the ability to not care about what other people think or, or be concerned about the judgment and opinion of others. It's so like, for example, I read like just it's trivial example of, of how this sort of happened was like growing up, you know, she always told me you can, do whatever you want you can be whatever you want don't care about what other people think but like i would read she put this little plaque next to my bed and it said i am the only unique me that will ever be i have the power to make a difference in this world and like i would read that every night and she'd be like you know read this and so like i just think that's something that i was just instilled that sort of thing from a young age and i i just never really cared about that like i had the confidence in high school to like drop out of football and go join musical theater. And like, obviously everyone thought I was, I was gay or that I was crazy or that this was stupid or that, you know what I mean? You get all those, yep. that ridicule, yep. but like, that was just kind of how I see the world largely because of how I grew up. And then when I coupled that with, again, this is, this was a hand I was dealt. This had nothing to do with any, any um, merit of my own. Not, not that, that it's even a merit. It's just about being self-aware. Like I'm just an extreme extrovert. So I get my energy from other people. Um, for example, even to this day, I would much rather work in a coffee shop or talk on the phone with someone to relax than to like read a book or stay at home. So like that's just where I get my energy. And so you couple that with being, you know, you, you're, you're dealt that hand and then you're also instilled this level of, of security with yourself and self-confidence that came straight from my mother. Um, it, it's just a you know, you, that's just one of the strengths that you have in life. I mean, I have many weaknesses. I have many things that I'm I'm very terrible at and, and many flaws, but that's not one of them. And so like, I just kind of played that. Like, I think in life you have to play to your strengths, right? So I was very aware that like, okay, I want, want to, I'm trying to make this practical because you're like, oh, well, I'm not dealt that hand. What do I do? So I'm I, like, I try to make it, it practical in the sense that like, I think to get ahead in anything in life, you really have to double down on your strengths and not worry as much about your weaknesses. So I knew that like, okay, if I'm going to succeed at poker, and maybe I didn't know this intuitively at the time, because I 
probably wasn't as you know methodical or self-aware, but I like it just seemed obvious to me that like what I'm gonna be good at or where I'm gonna how I'm gonna learn, how I how I you know interpret the world is I I I experience things in person with other people. So I like just naturally sort of built community and network and and you know people around me in poker that were very good. And I just connected with them and hung out with them and spent time with them because that was like the skill set that I had. You know, and so that was like that was just came naturally to me. And so I think everyone in poker has, you know, in, in life generally has different skill sets. There's people that are very intuitive that don't study math and that they, they still win at poker because they very well understand psychology and people and they play to those strengths. Then there's other people that strictly focus on game theory and math and they don't even, you know, look at their opponents, but they just are so good at the numbers that they win at poker. And so it's really important about understanding, being self-aware and understanding like where your strengths are and then, you know, playing your hand to that. And I think this was one of my strengths. And so that very natural to me, naturally to me in poker and, and in life as well. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's really good advice you're giving about the importance of people playing to their strengths and at the same time, like not being too concerned if they don't have the strengths that they think are supposed to be important or that society and mainstream push to be important because any skills that someone have when developed to a really high level are very valuable in certain environments. Yeah. Like I think society values or pushes people towards extroversion more because it's like, Oh, communicate your message, talk, give, give speeches, whatever. But if you're an introvert, you can be, you know, you can start a blog. You don't have to start a podcast. Like it doesn't really matter. Right. You can still communicate through, a medium that suits your personality. And so like, there's still ways to like, just play to your strengths, right? Like if you're super introverted, whatever, you're probably not going to start a YouTube show, but you can start a blog. Like I, you know, I'd rather have a podcast than a blog, but that's just me. You know, it doesn't make that medium better. But I do think the bottleneck to a lot of people, just going back to that is really like people care. Like one of the things that I think a lot of, a lot of people like would benefit from overcoming is just like the concern with what other people think. And I've noticed that like, I see a lot of people that are like, Oh, I have this thing I want to do or this business I want to start or this idea I want to pursue. And then when you really scratch away at the surface and get to the underlying reasons about why they're not actually doing that or or going forward with that activity, uh, it's, it, it comes down to their, their fear of the judgment of other people is more important to them than their own desires. Yeah. So the, the the opinions of what other people think have more weight on their decision making than their own personal desires. And that friction, I feel like, is a disaster because you're putting the interests of people you don't know or the people that are around you or the people that are going to judge you on social media higher than your own desires. And, and that's, I feel like, a recipe for unhappiness. So I think getting to a place where you're more confident your own desires and opinions for what you want and you place those on a pedestal above you know the, the the judgment or opinion of other people is 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 quite important to taking action on things that that you want to do with your life yeah i i completely agree and like a great example of that is this conversation this conversation probably should have happened a year ago two years ago at the time i wasn't feeling the very best about myself yeah. i wasn't the best of health fault. Yeah. And and I was like, oh, well, what are people going to think if I don't look as good on video as I did three years ago, four years ago? I can't go on there when I'm not looking my best or if it doesn't look perfect. Meanwhile, the most important thing is getting the message out there. The most important thing is getting the words out there and getting the connection, you know, getting you exposed to my audience and like your audience finding out about who I am as well, because there's a lot of stuff that we we have a similar message that people are going to resonate with and to not share that message is doing a disservice to everyone who's supposed to hear it. And I think that one of the things I heard you mention, because at first you're like, oh, you know, my my mother kind of gave me this affirmation. I was just kind of given it. But I think that if anyone put that message, you know, in their bedroom, uh, above their bed or on the bathroom mirror, on the kitchen table where they're going to see it first thing in the morning and last thing before they go to bed when they're kind of most programmable and most suggestible that... Um, you know, what I feel in my heart matters more than what other people think about me. And they expose themselves to that message every day for 30 days. That would break through 
Because if they're waking up and thinking that first thing and they're going to bed dreaming about that, those those activities and messages and, and dreams that really matter to them are going to come to the surface. And they're going to be like, right, I need to do that. Because instead of hearing the voice like, you're not good enough, you can't do that, the first voice they're hearing is, not only can you do that, you should do that because it's what you're here to do. And yeah, yeah, I, I think that's there's a lot of truth to that. Like, just repeating, like you, you know, what you put after the sentence, the, what you put after the phrase "I am" is 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 quite important. You know, mm -hmm. so if you say "I am this," like "I am lazy," you know, you're you're conditioning yourself to think that or believe that. You know, so I think if you you could kind of, yeah, I don't, you could kind of like condition yourself to to be a certain way right if you say like you know every day you know you're you're tired right yeah. you're, you're feeling tired but you yeah. jump out of your chair and you say i have a ton of energy and you yeah. jump up and you dance and you you know you, you yell out loud and you you run around your house like if you do that all the time you know you're you're, you're gonna condition yourself to have more energy right or like anything like that and that's i and right. i feel like that's another one where it's like if you you know, if you, you, like I did repeat that to myself all the time. And then you start, you know, behaving in that way. You start believing it. You start to like embody that belief. You start to absorb it. Yeah. And so I think, you know, what you being conscious of what you put after I am is, is, is quite important to how you end up behaving, you know, and sometimes it's a lot, it's a lot of times it's subconscious, mm -hmm. but like you said, you know, right before bed. Um, yeah, you know, and, it does and, take some work though. And, and the thing is, it does sure. feel very awkward in the beginning for sure. Um, and I've done this with other things where I'm 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 weak at, and I feel like I'm going through the motions. Like, you know, this is uh, this is stupid, or this is kind of embarrassing, or this is kind of like childish. But uh, you know, if you stick with it for months, I think it, you'll notice some improvement. Yeah, I'm actually having an experience with that right now. I'm doing a eight week Kundalini yoga intensive, where the the cool. exercises they have us do are just insane. And and I get to the point where I'm like, I'm tired. I don't need to do this. This is weird. Is this even going to work? And I say, where's that voice coming from? And I'm like, oh, that's the voice that I would put when I was, you know, six, seven, eight years old when I didn't want to have to put in the energy and the effort. And here's my opportunity to not listen to that voice, break through and show myself that what I used to believe isn't true anymore. Um, and and it, it's it's just amazing how how quickly it shifts. And I love what you said about moving around and, and getting the energy going because a lot of times people are tired, it's because they're resisting, they're clenching, they're giving themselves tension because they're not acting on their dream and that's stifling them and slowing them down. Whereas if they just do what they want to do or say what they need to say, suddenly they'd relax, they'd flow and they, they'd just feel more energy naturally and it would kind of just, you know, have, have a nice snowball effect from yeah, there. Yeah. You have a lot, lot of energy when you're, when you're excited about what's going on in your life. You, yeah. know, you just have more energy for things in general. <laughs> so yeah, I like, find that like when I'm feeling lethargic, it's, it's a lot of times, obviously if you're eating poor foods and you're not hydrated and you're not exercising, you're not sleeping, you're going to feel tired, right? You're not going to like overcome biology. But in general, um, if I'm feeling more excited on like an underlying level and like I have more energy on an underlying level, it's generally because I'm excited about getting up early the next morning because I know cool things are happening in my life. Yeah. And that's like a, that's a, a great metric to measure uh, what I'm doing. I always say like, if, if you're, if you're excited about getting up early the next couple of days, you're probably doing something with your time. That's, you know, worth pursuing. And if you're not, if you're like, ah, I just want to sleep in, I don't really care. I mean, obviously occasionally sleeping in fine, you should enjoy life and sleep in. But yes. like in general, if you're like apathetic towards the next week or two of your life, like that's a, a good time to reflect about where things are going. Yeah, I, I try and do that often because, you know, running, uh, you know, going on your own path, running your own business, doing things on your own, it's easy to kind of get sidetracked and then lose, lose, lose perspective or sight of, of the big picture. Yeah. So talking about running your own business and, and going on your own path, um, I know that you were doing some coaching in addition to poker at first. Um, but what, what made you decide to start a YouTube channel in, was it like 2014, 2000, cause 2015, you really started popping off and blowing up i remember so yeah yeah what led you to do that um good question so well, there's two things there one's the coaching which we'll come back to it later but mm -hmm. the youtube was basically just 
like I said, I, I, I am an extrovert. I love yeah. like talking and sharing things and, and teaching things is, is, is great too. And at, at that point, uh, I'd been in, in poker, you know, for almost a decade, uh, basically. And so more than that, I've been a professional for a decade, but I, I, I really felt like I learned a lot on my journey and I got to the point where, you know, playing poker wasn't as fulfilling anymore. Um, because at some point you're kind of like a hamster on a wheel, you know, like winning more or accomplishing another thing. Just, it doesn't, it, you know, it, it stops having the the fulfillment that it had originally. Um, and so I felt like I did a lot in poker that I wanted to do. And at that point I was like, you know, I would really like to share things and connect with others and, and help people on their journey. And so I'm like, well, let me, you know, just produce a video or two and, and share it and see what happens. And so I started with um, that idea. I never really planned on building a business on the back end of it. I never like that all came so much later when I just had a big following and people started asking me, Hey, do you offer coaching or Hey, uh, I really like your hand of the day videos. I just started sharing hands. I played around the world. So if you look at my early videos, I would be in a different city all the time. Yep. And I would go to a cool location and I would just film a hand. I would talk about a hand I played. And so the people like started to like the strategy and they're like, oh, do you have a book or do you have a course or a product? And then I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm I'm still playing a lot of poker, but I, I want to get more involved in the business side of things. Let me build those things to serve that need. So that kind of just came organically. But originally it was always just about connecting with others, sharing things I've learned and mainly like lessons I've learned in poker that apply towards life as well was really a compelling thing for me to share it was a driving factor in starting my youtube uh because i felt like poker was a great teacher for life and there were so many parallels between the way i saw the world the way i made decisions at the poker table mm -hmm. and i felt like a lot of those things gave me an edge in terms of evaluating things in business um like being analytical and thinking about you know, which variables actually account for more sales. And like poker teaches you to do that, to understand like, you know, was it luck that was the result of me winning this hand? Or was it because I made a correct decision at some point in the hand? And where was that correct decision? And how can I replicate? And then in the case of business, you know, like sort of replicate and scale that. There are just a lot of things that that crossed between business and life, you know, also just in life, like um, not um, like, judging situation based on the outcome right so you can say like oh it was so stupid to leave that party and go uh go home early because i got a ticket and it's like well no leaving the leaving the party was a good decision getting a ticket was a random outcome that happened that had nothing to do with leaving the party but like people confuse these things all the time and that's kind of a trivial example but they sort of equate outcome to merit of decision whereas poker teaches you not to do that it teaches you to evaluate each thing independently those are things that i find myself like very um, often utilizing in the real world. And so I, I wanted to build a brand and, and create a YouTube to share like those sorts of things. But somewhere along the way, quickly, you know, the hand of the day really caught on and people loved the poker strategy side of things. And so I kind of went more all in on that. And um, I've been doing a mixture of that and like, you know, life lessons as well. Um, and I actually opened a second YouTube recently to share strictly non-poker related content like mm -hmm. lessons i learned in poker that are you know apply to life but it's non-poker strategy related uh because i want to build that message out more as well yeah i think that's great and i i gotta give you a lot of credit man because a lot of people who are coming onto youtube now and watching the content now probably aren't aware of it but i know from watching the whole timeline and the growth of like poker on youtube that you were the guy that started single hand history reviews. You were the guy that started yeah. the hand of the day. Like you brought that format to YouTube. I remember when you were doing like poker hand replays and like it didn't yeah. matter how it looked because it was just really good information. Now everyone's doing it, but like you were the guy who started that for sure. Thank you. Yeah, that is true. That's how largely the brand got built. You know, it's yeah. that nobody was doing that before. And I was like, this would be great. Um, and people loved it. But yeah, now it's it's everywhere, and obviously the production value has gotten so much better. I mean, on on our channel as well, but yeah. on all the channels, yeah, there's live footage. I mean, that wasn't a thing, <laughs> um, and there's like you know freeze frames and all this stuff where you know like the editors have gotten better and like um, you know the production value has increased a lot. Whereas before it was just like 
like me on an iPhone, yep. you know, in the countryside of Switzerland shooting a hand and like just talking about, you know, this <laughs> hand. Uh, half the time there wasn't even a replayer. Some of the time there wasn't even a replayer. Yeah. Um, I remember when we got the replayer, I was like, wow, this is revolutionary. You know, and that was an old crappy replayer uh, that was just so bad. But um, yeah, those were good times. But you, man, you were on, speaking of YouTube pioneers, you were on YouTube, I think like before anyone was even on YouTube in poker. So yeah. let alone the hand of the day. Um, yeah, dude, you were, well, how did you get started on YouTube? Like, how did you know to get into YouTube? Like, like literally like 15, 10, 15 years ago. That's crazy. Yeah, well, I have to give credit to, you know, the people that I was working with who saw the opportunity that I didn't because I was a poker player um, and I was also an affiliate marketer. So like yourself, I was a very okay. successful cool. affiliate marketer. Um, like the reason that I got the website grips.com was because, dude, I was sitting on my front porch with my buddy from high school. We were just talking talking like wiggers because we were listening to hip hop and you know we thought we were cool like that um and he just he's he's mentioned something about he was going to go grip something and i'm like oh grips yeah and like past tense that would be like grips so like you got that is grips you know what i'm going to make my new screen name grips.com just for fun you know i'm just going to do that so i made the screen name and i'm like well if my screen name has a dot com in it i might as well buy the website and then when I yeah. bought the website, I knew nothing about internet or like web pages, but I knew how to upload a text file. So I uploaded a text file that explained Rakeback and why the particular site I was working for had the best Rakeback deal of the ones available. <clears throat> cool. And from there, I'm like, well, this is working. People are signing up, but I, I can't just have a text file up there. That, that looks really hack. So I started reaching out to web developers saying, hey, can we build a website here? Can we do something? And the thought was, you know, back then it was all rev share. So the more that people play, yeah. the more the affiliate would right. make. And I said, well, if yeah. if I need people to play more, I've got to teach them how to play better. You know, that's that's going to be the key for success. So I, I was watching all the training videos out there and I knew there was the card runners, Deuces Cracked. I think Blue Fire Poker had just come out. And I'm like, they're great videos, but no one has a yeah, structured... Yeah, that was back in the day, man. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, but no one had a structured yep. course. So I said, all right, I'm going to do my best to teach people how to play poker in, you know, two to three hours. And so I made the first course. It was a free course that just broke down, um, you know, how poker works with the importance of going after the blinds and antis, bankroll management, pre-flop play, position, aggression, selection, post-flop, adjusting to opponents and all those things. And I'm like, great, I've got this course. Now what do I do with it? And the web guy said, put it on YouTube. And I'm like, really? Like, I put a lot of work into wow. this. We're, ju we're just going to give it away? He's like, yeah, just put it on YouTube. It'll work out. And that's how the channel got started. And it was kind of just slow for a while. That was in 2008. I just put those up. But because, Crazy, because because the titles were good and the topics were good, and no one else had poker themed videos. If you searched no how to win at poker, how to make money, poker strategy, you were finding my videos and the information in them was great. The production quality, yeah. whatever, it was 2008, but the information was great and it worked. And then it was the same thing for Twitch. Um, you know, after Greggy won the main event, and he moved away and I was just like, okay, what do I do now? My roommate just left. I'm, I'm off this crazy high. How can I replicate that high? Um, I don't want to play cash because it's not going to be as exciting. So I asked my web guy, what do I do? And he said, start streaming on Twitch. Just, just start streaming on Twitch, stream daily, and it'll work out. And okay. it, it was the same thing. I got there before it was right when Jay Carver started. And that really worked. You know, I got in front of a new audience, got a lot of growth, got a lot of expansion. The one thing was because I wasn't super extroverted and I wasn't super social, you know, I was more of a intellect, a theory based person, which is why I liked PowerPoint presentations. Twitch didn't quite work for me. And so yeah, it really yeah. it really burnt me out. And I'm like, OK, this isn't my format. I love the game, but I teach best when I'm, you know, going from a presentation like I'm running a seminar or something. Yeah, so it gotcha. helped me find my style, but I found that I loved YouTube because I could take anyone's question. You know, you had Ask Alec, I had Project Get Me yeah. Stack in, where they could send in a question, but it wasn't like, oh, I got to figure out on the fly how to answer. I'm like, I can take my time, make a presentation, yeah. and then give them the presentation that's well thought out with the answer. And I can communicate the thought and help them 
kind of settle their mind and get a clear course of action to take to find a solution to their problem. And that's on a deep level, that's that's what I've always been. I, I, I came from a home with a lot of stressed out people. So I had to kind of figure out how to make things okay. And the way to do that was to, to give people something they could do that was simple, that that eased the stress and got them the result they wanted. And then just cool. You know, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's you, also about, like you said, knowing what your strengths are yeah. and knowing like what how you can communicate in a way that's natural to you and then effective the others. Yeah. I also found that one thing was really good, and I, I kind of want to ask if you had the same experience with hand of the day, was that as as I was teaching the stuff, it was making more sense to me. And I would like make a presentation totally. and I'd explain the stuff and then halfway through the presentation I'd be like, Oh, I just learned something new right there. And yeah. right there, and like my brain started firing where I'm like, wow, here is a way to study that I'm getting the best benefit ever. And if I didn't have this accountability from YouTube, I wouldn't be doing the studying. I wouldn't be doing the homework. So it became something that started to serve me in a way that I didn't even expect. And then I just got hooked on. I'm like, why would I ever stop? This is serving me yeah. and serving other people. I'm being valuable. I'm getting friends. I'm getting connected. Like it was just an amazing feeling of what YouTube did. It allowed me to put myself out there without feeling my insecurities that I would feel normally from being in a big crowd or being overwhelmed from too many people. Yeah. Totally. And, and I had a very similar experience and I get this question a lot where people are like, why would you teach others to get better? And it's going to hurt you. They're going to come play better against you. And I'm like, man, the value I've got from teaching is so much like higher than any risk of like people getting better or playing better against me. Like it's not even comparable. Yeah. For example, um, one of the pillars that at Conscious Poker we teach is a like linear four step process for making decisions, right? Cause mm -hmm. people are always like struggle with this sort of deer in headlights type of um, mindset where like they get involved in a hand and they're like, I'm overwhelmed. What do I think about? Or I just blank out on the river in big pots. Um, or I, I'm faced with a huge decision. And now I'm like, there's so many variables to consider. How do I like in a linear way, think through the hand and figure out what they have. Mm -hmm. So like, I got this question from so many readers and, and people that I was coaching that I like through explaining my thought process, I had to get better at understanding my own thought process. Cause I, now I, like, it's easier to, it's easy to intuitively know how you do something, it's harder to actually communicate that in a way that someone else can then apply, not just understand, but actually apply to their own game. Mm -hmm. So over the course of a couple of lessons with one of, my, one of my clients or a couple of my clients, I would start to explain exactly what I thought every single hand. And I was like, this is my thought process, not just like what I'm thinking about in this particular hand, but this is the thought process that I use that I apply to every hand. Like this is my system. This is my blueprint. Yeah. And so I condense that down into four steps where I'm like, this is exactly what I do. Like step one, step two, step three, step four. And I ended up being inspired to put that into a product because like so many people ask me about it, we put it into a book and eventually it just got to the point where like I was teaching the same thing all the time to my private clients and whatever that I made a blog post about it and it's now free at Conscious Poker. Uh, it's called Mastering the Art of Hand Reading and it's literally you know, an overview of that four step process mm -hmm. um, that I use for hand reading. And then of course, there's like an entire course I built on that inside our membership where um, where I have a, a video course on that very process. But like this became like so much more clear to me that this is what I actually do in every single hand I play. And I'm like, wow, like this is how I think about a hand. And before it was just something that happened automatically, subconsciously. But now it's actually clear and conscious where I'm like, I know exactly what I think every single hand. So now sometimes I fall victim to like, there's high pressure. I'm in a tough situation. What do I do? And then now I'm like, well, let me go back to this linear thought process that I created. <laughs> and this is what I actually do. Let me just follow this. So I could like treat myself like a dummy. You know, it's kind of like scheduling out your day before you have your day. You just kind of follow the schedule you already set for yourself. Right. And I have that with my own thought process. And so I would never have been aware of that had I not been forced to teach it to other people in my in my uh, private coaching or whatever. And the same happens on a micro level when I review these other people's hands. Like they send me their hands and then I go into the lab, I go into Poker Cruncher and I analyze the hand and I'm like, oh wow, mm -hmm. this is actually a better way to play this hand. And I just got 
you know, better as a player because I'm, I'm like, you know, learning how to explain everything to other people. So it's been incredible. I've become so much better because of, because of coaching and, and I, and I really love it for that. Yeah. And that's, that's a really great segue. Uh, you brought us on, uh, we're going to circle back to the good life, which was the original plan, but I mean, you got a straight to conscious sure. poker. Whatever. So I remember when you first launched four step poker and I remember going to the yeah. website and being like, okay, he's got like a $500 course, like must be really good if it's 500 bucks. And I didn't know exactly about your background, but you know, we have that one mutual friend and I just knew that you played cash in Macau and I knew you'd been around the scene forever. I'm like, Alec is definitely very good. I have no idea what's in that program, but it's probably very good if it's coming from him. Um, and I know there was an evolution along the way. So can you talk about how um, conscious poker evolved or how four step poker evolved into conscious poker and why you felt you needed to make the shift and what got added as a result? Yeah, that's a good question. So I originally thought of four step poker because I was like, okay, this is the, like the, the, the methodology that I use to teach, right? Like this is like yeah. generally the core of like how I explain poker strategy to other people, like follow this process and you can obviously, you know, learn how to tweak it and all that stuff. But like, this is kind of like the blueprint that I think works really well. Mm -hmm. And I've had a lot of success with clients that have used it and it's, it's a good thing to fall back on of like, this is how to approach the game. So I just, you know, without much creativity sort of called the brand that and i just called the product that and that was just like this is what it is you know yeah. um and so a couple of years ago i started to think more about like what i actually wanted to build and like what was inspiring me about creating content and actually having you know at some point like the, the business was going well people were buying courses and products and coaching and I actually like kind of woke up and I actually had, you know, a poker sort of business, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, like now I have like things to manage. I have customers, I have emails, I have like things coming in and I'm like really wanting to build a brand, but I want to do it more than just have a brand that, that has the name of the strategy I teach, but that also has like kind of a, a mission behind it, you know, and yeah. something that I'm passionate about and that, hopefully can do, you know, a, a little bit more than just teach poker strategy. So I wanted to call it conscious poker because, and, and that name kind of just evolved out of this sort of process I was going through uh, in, in life where I was like thinking about, you know, what was really meaningful to me. And um, it was at a unique time in my life where I was really thinking about, well, I was really aware of just like the role of luck in in life and how lucky I was to be, um, I, I gave a keynote about this too. So that kind of forced me to condense these thoughts. Like we talked about with coaching. Um, I, I was, I was asked to do a keynote for, um, for, for Cisco and also for a marketing conference, uh, in real estate. And so one of the things that I was talking about was like one of the lessons I learned from poker. And I was like, okay, well, what, what did poker really teach me? Like, I only have 30 minutes, right? Like I, I could pick 10 things that poker taught me, maybe more. Like I talk about anything from, you know, decision making to bankroll management to whatever. But then I was thinking like, what's the one message I'd like to be, I don't want to say remembered for, hopefully I'll have other keynotes, but like, what's the one thing I'd like people to, to, to see? So then I thought like, wow, you know, the, the thing that I really realized in poker is that there's a large amount of luck in poker and there's a large mm -hmm. amount of luck in life. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's completely beyond our control, right? Like you can't control the hand you're dealt. You could only control how you play the cards. And that was really the theme of what I was thinking a lot about at that time in my life. And I was like, wow, if you think about the hand you're dealt in life as, an, as a metaphor, like I, I would wager that everyone listening to this was dealt a winning hand. Like your, you, like your hand might not be as good as someone else's, but it's still like a premium hand. It's still like pocket tens or better, right? Like half the world, right? Like just look at the numbers, like half the world lives on 250 a day or less. So that means, you know, 50-50, right? Like you're all in with jacks, they have ace king. Like that could be you, right? Like before and you have no control over this, right? So before you're born, you know, the universe like flips a coin and if it's heads, you're born in the first world, you know, worrying about, 
the long line at the coffee shop and what you're going to, you know, like whatever, right? Your morning routine and all these first world problems that really don't matter in the, in the grand scheme of things. Or if it's tails, you're born in the third world and you're, you're living on 250 a day and you're, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're stricken with poverty and disease and you, you can't get out of that situation. And that's just luck. That's the hand you're dealt. And so I was trying to convey this message to other people. And then I realized like, wow, that's the core of like what I think poker teaches you is that like, there's so much luck in life and it's arguably the most the, the most important thing to happen to us is that we're dealt a winning hand, but it's the thing that we most often take for granted. And so I wanted that to be like the larger message of what I personally was trying to teach within the industry of poker and using poker as a vehicle to help other people see this in their own life, that like they were born lucky and to be grateful for that every day. And then sure, focus on how to play the hand the best way possible. And I talk about my decision-making process and poker that I think apply to life using like, you know, logic to make decisions and those sorts of things. And, and the relationship between intuitive decision making and logical decision making that, that also you have to use in poker. But I wanted that to be like, really my core message is that people to be more grateful for the amount of luck they had in their life, because it's really easy to see in poker that luck changes all the time. And it could be easily you that's on the shitty side of bad beat. That could happen to you in life too. And that's something that you don't get to run twice. You don't get to run your life twice. Like if you're born in Africa where like people ha are dying of AIDS, like you don't get to run it twice. You're just mm -hmm. fucked, mm -hmm. you know? And so the fact that you weren't born there means you're all, you've already won. Like there is nothing that could happen at the poker table that could change the fact that you're running ahead of the curve in terms of luck. And so I wanted to make people more conscious of this. And so I was like, okay, well, conscious poker seems like it has a good uh, ring to it. And, and that's kind of more of the larger purpose and message of my brand. Um, you know, one of the things we did is partnered with reg charity to give back to people that weren't dealt the winning hand in life. Like, right. When you're, you're yeah. aware of that, I, I felt compelled to be like, okay, well let's take part of the money that comes in and donate to donate to people that just were dealt shitty hands. And, yeah. um, and so that was like a larger um, reason for changing the brand and, and creating a mission behind it. And I felt compelled to do that as you know, an influencer in the space and also someone that actually realized like, okay, now I have a business, I have customers, I have people that are coming to me and whatever, like, where do I want to take this? Um, so that was largely the motivation behind it. And I mean, as for the products, that's almost like not as, not as, not as uh, important, so to speak. Yeah. But what we did create is a, what I realized that everybody wanted was a community and, a, and, and like a way to connect with other people. Um, because they didn't have people they could learn from. They didn't weren't fortunate like you and I to come up with, you know, Greg and Tom and, you know, mm -hmm. people that we came up and got better and learned poker with. So that wanted, I wanted that to be the foundation for uh, what we created at, at Conscious Poker. And so we built a membership where um, people have like a monthly group call with me. And so like I host these like monthly strategy calls and everybody gets on together and we review hands and I answer questions and it's interactive. And then we have a private Facebook group that's moderated by myself and a coach where um, they post hands and we answer and everybody gets a response. Everybody gets their questions answered. Uh, and so we, we created that community feel as the backbone of the service that we offered uh, through the brand to help people on their poker journey to really have that support. That's awesome. I, I agree with you completely that the most important thing is community and is having support like especially in poker where there's so much uncertainty and where humans in general feel pretty uncomfortable with uncertainty and it can drive them insane to just like not know the answers to things like that keeps a lot of people up at night that just being able to get a second or a third or a fourth opinion on a situation to kind of give it closure like hey did yeah. i make a mistake or was this mistake horrible or is it kind of okay that that really helps people settle a lot and settle a lot of the nerves and a lot of the anxiety that poker kind of stirs up. And I feel like, you know, community is the only way we can really get that. Yeah. And like, I noticed that I, that's my behavior now. Like, let's say, okay, I busted out of the main, let me send the hand I busted to three or four friends and just having them say, okay, that's fine. You know, yeah. really goes a long way. So like, even if it's just something like that, like a positive reinforcement, or I have a question about something, I do that with my little pod of, you know, high stakes friends that, that play poker. So like, I'm like, I want to create that for other people. And then they have, you know, they just pop in their Facebook, Facebook group, drop a question like, Hey, I'm going on a downswing. Uh, you know, I've played this many sessions. These are my results. Is this normal? And just having 
you know, me or another coach or some, someone in the community come in and say, oh yeah, we've, we've gone through that before. It's totally normal. Make these adjustments. This won't work for me. Go back out and, you know, go on your journey and crush it on your next session uh, or doing that in a live call where they can just like pop in, you know, ask a question and then we can have a chat uh, in, in real time. Uh, does go a long way. Of course, there's there's the strategy component and there's the videos and the courses and the thing that actually help them be better at poker to increase their win rate. But it, it's it's um it's it's gone a long way and, and people that have been in it for a while love that aspect of it. And I think that's um what we're trying to to grow and focus on. Yeah. Okay. So do you also you do also have some other coaches with the brand? Because from what I'd seen, like kind of up until now, at least like it's been all you and I was going to ask yeah. why you decided to just kind of spearhead it and keep it as a lone wolf project or is it or have you had a bit of expansion as well? So we have one other coach that does moderate the Facebook group. Yeah. And so he gives feedback on all the hands. I also moderate the Facebook group and I, I'd like to say I respond to every thread. I might miss one or two here and there. Yeah. but. Um, I pretty much, at least up to this point, respond to every thread. Uh, he responds to every thread too. Um, that just gives a second pair of eyes and opinion in there. And he's a uh, cash game pro. He's been, you know, crushing the one, three, two, five, mm -hmm. up to five, ten cash games for uh, ten years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's great to have that perspective because he's actually in the streets playing the games that the people that are the members are playing. Yeah. So he has like a, you know, a different perspective than, than I might have. That's like actually understands the flow of those sorts of games uh, in that way. And he's also great at all the other stuff, like the, the, the mindset, the bankroll management, all those sorts of things. You know, he's an, he's an A player. Yeah. Um, but I've thought about building a brand behind it and getting other coaches um, to either create courses for the membership or standalone courses for conscious poker, or maybe host the group calls. Um, I want to be very careful about the partnerships that I set up and, and, and think more about where I want the brand to go. Uh, I do have some milestones I want to achieve before I bring on someone. And I also have to think about the structure of the deal that they would have. And there's a lot of moving pieces to having someone. And, and it's kind of like one of those things that um, it's like having a kid. There's really, you know, there's, there's no going back. You don't want to bring someone on board and structure a deal. And go through all that that work and then have them build pen and courses, whatever, and then you know, like not have a clear direction for your brand and what you're trying to do ultimately. Yeah. Um and and then like the they, they stop producing content or something like that. You know, you have to have a very clear long-term strategy. And so I want to build the brand up more on my own before I do that. That said, it, it is in the works. I have some potential people in mind. Uh, it would be exciting to do something like that. And I do eventually see myself moving out of the content creation space for the membership and kind of turning that over to other coaches. Uh, also getting coaches under me because I'm, I'm like, I, I can't take on many more clients than I already have. I can't really, yeah. uh, I'm not looking to like coach full time. I only work with, you know, two or three or four clients a month. Um, and I've had more inquiries than that. So there, some of the people are asking me, well, do you have a sub coach under you that, and you know, you can, that, you've worked with that can teach these sorts of things. So those things have come up clinically in terms of the, the need for the brand, but I so far haven't done it, but it is potentially in the pipeline and uh, it is compelling, exciting to potentially think about that as yeah. growth for the brand as well. Yeah. I, I know what you mean because when it's, when it's just you, we'll it's a lot easier. We'll for, it's, it's a lot easier for the brand to be very mobile you know, you, you, you can make changes, you can kind of flow with it and control it how you want. And I just feel like it's, it's easier to schedule when it's just you, because you know, you can count yeah. on yourself. You don't have to deal with any back and forth. And as soon as you bring other people on now, you're, now you go from being a content creator and a visionary oh, like and a, a teacher business manager. to a manager. Yeah, you're like a, yeah. Yeah. And like, it's like, I'd almost want a partner to do the operations of like, you know, managing this and then building out the team on the back end of that. And like, I just oversee the vision and the strategy because managing that on a day-to-day -day basis and coordinating with them. And then you have to have deadlines. You, like there's just so many moving parts that I think in the beginning I thought, oh, I'm going to do that for sure. But then when I started to get into the weeds of building the brand and the business and like seeing how much work was involved and all the moving parts, I mean, we already, at Conscious Poker, we already have a team of like five people that I'm interacting with pretty regularly. Uh, and we're, we're 
bringing on one more person this month. So it's like, it's already a lot to manage and then managing a whole team of content creators. Yeah. Uh, it's just <laughs> overwhelming. I already am doing a, a lot of jobs at once anyway. So um, yeah, it is appealing, but it is completely a different step uh, for the brand and the business. So we'll see. Yeah, I, wa- I wanted to kind of ask how you keep up with it because you're active on, you're very active on Twitter. You're very active on Instagram. I, I went through the profile. I saw you've been posting like epic travel pics since I don't even know how far back. You've got you, videos on YouTube coming out like almost every day, it seems like. Um, sometimes it's a couple times a week, but you're always there. You're always consistent. And I think we probably yeah. hit on it before with, you know, you being excited about what's coming out the next day and building up the vision and working towards that. But still, you know, how do, how do you find the energy to consistently do that to manage five people and and not ever get burnt out so i um i'm not like necessarily proud of this but um i went um (laughs) staying with uh my mom here in orange county and uh we have a pool in the backyard that i went in all the time when i was growing up yeah and i loved it like some of my best memories are in the pool with friends and i've um been with my wife for eight years Mm -hmm. and obviously she's been to my my parents house many times every summer we're here after the world series and a week ago was the first time we went in the pool like we were always look at the pool and we're like there and whatever but we never went in the pool and yes Mm -hmm. like the the, we we real like we went in the pool last week and i was like wow like we never do this sort of thing and so all this is to say again it's not something i'm proud of but like a, a very naturally like a type personality and one of the hardest things for me is to detach from what i'm doing like i think it's not necessarily binary but typically people are in the in in the in they, they, there's always something they have to manage with the balance and there's nothing inherently better about one versus the other but typically people you know under work where they, they they're a little lazy or apathetic and they have to kind of get kicked in the ass all the time to get shit done or they yeah. overwork and they do a lot and they have to kind of like consciously tone things down to find things they do to detach and balance. And I'm definitely the latter. Like I'm always plugged in. Like I usually am doing something seven days a week. Um, and that's just been something I've had to like, that's just a challenge for me to like not think about work, not think about a project I'm doing and, and, you know, to force myself to like go on vacation. And then while I'm on vacation, I have to force myself to, not check in as much or read, you know, not absorb content. So I'll literally block out everything. I won't absorb any content or I'll read a novel about France instead of a business book. And so like, it's been just a challenge for me throughout my life where I'm like very active and doing a lot. And so I always like to be busy every moment and stimulated and like always producing and creating. Um, and so it's, it's actually just my default operating mode that I'm like doing a lot of things and juggling a lot of things and managing a lot of projects. And and while on one hand, it's allowed me to be you know, successful, so to speak, by the standard definition in business, it's also been like something that um, <laughs> I've had to like, you know, work with to find balance with as well. So yeah, it, it's just like a double-edged sword, you know, like it, it, I do produce a lot and I do a lot and I'm very active. I, like I said, I manage the five people. I have two YouTubes. Uh, I have a newsletter that goes out every Monday. I post all the time on social media. Yeah. I um, I have the membership. I create a video for every week. So I'm probably doing like 15 videos a month plus a coaching call and four clients. But at the same time, I'm also like, I go in my pool once every decade. So uh, I do have to find, find more balance in these sorts of things. And that's something that I'm, I'm definitely getting better at with uh, in the last couple of years. I've gotten a lot better, but it's always something I have to check in with. Um, yeah. I, I'd say the last sort of thing that I'm, I'm good at is I'm very efficient with creating systems. So like I'm good at sort of like optimizing time. So I'm actually, I think I can get a lot done in a shorter amount of time because I'm like the, the systems of the business run very well. And I have like one person that specializes in everything and they're all very good a players. So they all do their jobs very well. And they allow me to just focus on creating the content. Um, and so that helps me leverage my time to be impactful when I only have 
a couple hours to get something done on a certain day, I can get a lot done in those few hours. So it might seem on the surface like more is happening than it is because I'm like efficient in that way. So that's also, there's again, part of the one of the other skills I have. I know I've only talked about my skills. Believe me, I have many, many flaws, but um, <laughs> that's another skill that I have. And so that's allowed me to be you know, very efficient in a two or three hour block of work where I can get four hours or five hours of work done. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that my, uh, my holistic life coach teacher, Paul Check taught me for, you know, a type personalities. I'm very much like that too. I want to achieve as much as I can get as much output as I can. So when I look back, I can feel accomplished and feel proud of all the things that I did in a day. He, he talked about the importance of both scheduling spiritual time, yeah whether it's yoga and a movement practice or a seated meditation practice, or just listening to music, going for a walk in the woods um, and scheduling, putting things in your schedule that are for you. So if people are like, hey, are you available at this time? You're like, no, I have a date with myself. And what am I doing? I'm just being with me. And the other thing he, he suggested that the older I got, the more I realized was true. And the, the more I was producing stuff, the more I realized was true was the importance of scheduling a full day off a week. You know how a lot of religions have Sundays, the day of rest. And now I understand it that when, when we drop that and we don't follow that, if we don't follow a religion or whatever, and we don't have that day of rest, we're in trouble. But if yeah. we can give ourselves that day of rest to be like, okay, this is the day that I go to the beach, swim in the pool. Yeah, I've been doing that too. And it's crazy what one day i would used to not have that one day it's crazy what one day does yeah so now i'm like one day i'm like wow one day is so much yeah <laughs> and that one day it's yeah, like I, I, you have fun and you enjoy yourself but it also all the things that were kind of uncertain what during the week or that you were processing now they can be digested and suddenly like they make sense i feel like that off time is a yeah. chance for things to suddenly fit together and see how this book and this course and this project how they all fit together as opposed to being kind of three blocks of information that you know like like a tetris game at first they're just the pieces as they are but when you take like the time that. to stop you rotate them and suddenly they fit into a nice line and boom they can go away and you have that free space again plus you got more points <laughs> Yeah, I feel like on a micro level, I'm good at that on a daily basis. So like every morning I have, you know, I'd say like an hour of rev up time where like, like no matter what time I get up, the first hour is like nobody talks to me. Like I just do my thing. Yeah. Um. So that's kind of like my morning routine. And then I would say like at night, I'm not as good at it, but usually I'll have like a couple time at night and I'm and I will always find time to do something together, uh, usually cook and eat and then like watch a movie or a show, go on a walk. So there's always like a decompressed time that we do we have as a couple. And then I would say like just throwing in a like if I have a particularly busy day, I'll throw in like a 10 minute, even t even five to 15 minutes. I don't really set a timer, but like a meditation session to kind of like transition from the day of intense focus and work to like personal time at night. Um, I feel like that just kind of lets my thoughts like just flow out of my subconscious and I could just kind of be aware of them. Sometimes I'll, mm -hmm. you know, document things or write things down that are ideas that come out of that session or things that I have to do the next day. And that kind of allows like those, you know, ruminating thoughts that are kind of like just, you know, maybe preventing you from relaxing or, or calming down or sleeping or whatever it is, or kind of keeping you mentally engaged to just kind of like flow out. And then that really helps me as well. And I've noticed that like, if I do that for like five minutes, even during the middle of a busy day, um, I could then just kind of calm down and then refocus again for like two, three hours. So that's like a hack that's worked really well for me where like all I could do like intermittent meditation throughout the day for like five minutes at a time, 10 minutes at a time. And that could just allow me to keep going and being productive the rest of the day and then also just decompressing at night. Um, so like throwing those things in there, like you said, obviously like everyone has their own physical practice, whatever that is for you, if it's yoga or the gym or swimming, whatever, mm -hmm. those sorts of things are great. And I, I really try and be disciplined about doing that on a daily basis. And that's one of the ways that I, I think I don't burn out because I'm so disciplined about knowing that I need that personal time, even if it's, albeit small, uh, really goes a long way. You know, I could cut down my hour routine in the morning to 30 minutes. Like I did today, I was short on time. So I divided my meditation and my run in half, but I still did it. And yeah. so even that short, kind of like the 80-20 principle, even if you do, um, you know, 
twenty percent of the the effort, it still gives you eighty percent of the benefit. So uh, even even if it's short, um, it still goes a long way for for, for me at least. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm hearing hacks and I'm hearing the importance of the morning routine. Are you Tim Ferriss guy, Tony Robbins guy, Gary well, V guy, any of the above? Yeah, so I'm familiar with all of them. Um, I started following Tim Ferriss in 2005. I read the Four Hour Work Week, and so I was like one of the first, like, a, like you know, I read it right when it came out. So I was like adopting his content right away. That had a huge. Um, impact on the way I saw things because I was like just starting my poker journey and I really thought about things in a different way in terms of like building a lifestyle and and reverse engineering to have your whatever you do for money to give you the lifestyle you want and not the other way around you know not working to get a lifestyle that you don't necessarily want or need just for the sake of doing it so that really shaped the way I thought about things um but like I would say, I think maybe five, 10 years ago, the, these sorts of things like these morning routines and, and, and productivity hacks and stuff were like a little bit more useful because they were a little bit less saturated in terms of like the content that's being put out. Whereas I feel like now it's become to the point where it's like, there's almost this like stigma or pressure around following this precise morning routine or this precise workout or this precise diet or this precise like everything and if you don't do that then you're not like as you know you're not going to be as big of a crusher or whatever and i feel like it's kind of got blown out of proportion where it's like ultimately sure there's merit in doing a lot of the like checking a lot of the boxes that seem like okay a lot of um a lot of uh successful people adopt like exercise meditation whatever but at the same time, I think there's 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 a lot to be said, and it's it's probably undervoiced at this point in in the the sort of like entrepreneurship community of like just finding what really works for you, and like sure experiment with all these things, but then like understand what really works well for you, and like what order those things work for your own life. I guess just be your own self experimenter, and just try not to put too much pressure on following what someone else does or doing something for the sake of doing it, but actually like adopting practices and routines and, and, and things that ultimately will help you based on, you know, your, the way you operate. And then also being aware of like that changes on a daily basis. Whereas like some days you might not follow your routine because you don't feel like you need to. And that's, that's okay too. You know, not putting too much pressure on yourself. I feel like there's a lot of that out there today. Yeah, I agree. Um, especially in the the business world, like people who follow too many productivity gurus are just getting inundated nonstop about all the things they could do to be productive. And especially like in marketing, where people are saying that, you know, their way is the way and their message is right. And they're communicating what works for them, but they're communicating it so adamantly and so powerfully that people are like, oh, maybe that could be it for me too. And the thing is, when you jump from you know, being intense at yoga to intense at CrossFit to intense at weight training to intense at boxing to intense at triathlon. And you don't stick with one. You don't allow your body to develop and attune to it. And you don't allow your mind to get used to that routine and really get the benefit. And I th- I, I'm kind of with you that it's good to try them all. And, you know, once you're like, okay, this is the one that kind of resonates with me. This is what feels good. This is the style I like. Just go with that one and know that it's good enough. There's so much concern about being perfect. There's a lot of fear-based thinking about making mistakes that if we don't do the absolute best thing, we're doing something wrong. But the thing that feels right for you is probably the best thing. And the more that you do it, the more it will become the best thing because it's what you are attuned to at a deep level, right? Like if you're- also understanding what's right in the moment, right? Where like, you know, you're, you're, you're weight training a lot and then maybe you do that for six months and then maybe, you, you know, your body needs a break. So you yes. get more into yoga and like, just not, you know, only following something because you've done it in the past and realizing like that might not serve you in the future. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm like very intuitive with my approach towards things. And so I just kind of like go about life in the day that sort of way. And so some days I'll be like, ah, I feel like I need this or I need whatever, like I need more time to downtime or I need to eat more. I'm not as hungry. You're like, whatever it is, right? Like everything yeah. uh, about that. So 
uh, I, I try and operate that way. And, and that, that works well for me when I'm, when I'm checking in often. Yeah. Some, something I've added that I like, you know, how everyone has the to-do list. One day I wrote one out. I'm like, yeah. okay, this is not a to-do list. This is a can-do list. So it's not that I need to check all the boxes. It's that I have the option to check a few of them and I'll feel good. And one productivity program from Eben Pagan told me to write down my perfect productivity day and my perfect relaxation day. And I realize if, if I write out kind of the 20 things that would fit into the ultimate productivity day and the 20 things that would fit into the ultimate relaxation day, then on any given day, I can say, okay, I want to be more productive. I'll, I'll try to check five things from that productivity basket and one of the relaxation. And then I know what all my options are, but I also know it's not to do, it's can do. So they're all just options and I only need to do as many as feel right and never feel like I need to do all of them. And I never, and I also, I don't have to like figure out like some new thing to do. Cause I'm like, here are the 10 to 20 things that, that work for me to satisfy this need. I can just kind of choose my own adventure. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. I like that a lot. That's a great practical tip. And one of my mentors, uh, a long time ago told me, um, I was just having a conversation. I said, Oh, you know, I have to do this tomorrow. And they said, do you have to, or are you choosing to? And I just remember that really stuck with me because like, you know, like we talked about at the beginning, like what you put after the word I am, or I have, or I must, or I need, like that becomes the way that you sort of think about it. So when you tell yourself, you know, I have to do this tomorrow, it becomes a command. Whereas I have the option to do this tomorrow becomes a choice and when you have choices, you know, you're capable of deciding whether or not you want to do that. And so I'm totally with you on the way that you structure these sentences it has a huge difference in the way subconsciously that you interpret something. People are like, oh, you know, I have a job. I have to go to work tomorrow. But like that, you know, like sure that, that this is just, you know, sort of a quintessential example. But um, not even thinking that you have the option to do something else keeps you stuck in the same process you're always in, whether it's with a job you don't like or a career you don't like or yeah. a relationship you don't like or whatever it is. Right. And so just realizing you have choice is huge. And I love what you said about, about that. That's a great tip for so many people um, to a can do list, I think is great. And then obviously the other thing about, you know, blending that day and just being aware every day of like today, I want to be more productive. I'm going to do 80, 20. Yeah. Or today I want to be more lax relaxed. I'm going to do 20, 80. Yeah. Um, and I think being aware of like, that balance is always changing every day, right? Like if you had an 80, 20 or 90, 10 the day before, you might not want four 90, 10s in a row, you know? Yeah. So um, that's great advice, man. I really, really like that. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I learned recently that the most important thing that humans can have is the feeling yep. of, uh, the feeling of autonomy and the feeling of choice. Cause yeah. when they have that, they're capable of anything. When they feel like they're boxed in and they don't have the freedom to choose or express or do anything, they get knocked down to like 10% capacity because, you know, it's it's not coming from the place that they want it to come from. So autonomy, even if it's just a false feeling of autonomy, creates a lot of um, power. And speaking of autonomy, speaking of choice, I want to know what it was like when you chose to go play poker in Macau because I feel like you were there right when it started. Um, yeah, what, was what? That, what was that experience like when when you went out there and started mixing it up with those guys? Yeah, that was like by far the best poker experience of my life. And also because, you know, on a personal level, um, I was just getting serious with my now wife and we moved out there together. So it was, you know, nice. we were building our life together as well as creating these incredible memories and all these incredible experiences where, um, for example, you only have a 30 day visa in Macau. So every 30 days you have to leave the country and then you could only come back for 20 days and then you have to leave for a month. So that forced us to get creative with our lifestyle and take all of these justified trips to all of Southeast Asia. So we went to Singapore and Cambodia and Thailand and Indonesia um, and, and many, many places around within those countries. Um, and and that, that was kind of a lot of the inception of when I realized that I was dealt a winning hand in life too, mm -hmm. where I had these experiences in these third world countries where I was like, wow, you know, there were a lot of people that weren't dealt premium hands in life. Um, but, uh, you know, that was amazing. Cause I got to see all that with, 
a, a woman I loved that was super supportive of me. And we were also building, you know, a business together at the time we were running, we, you were, we were both in affiliate marketing for a long time. I started that from the party poker days. And then I ended up doing, um, other affiliate marketing in, in like lead generation, mm -hmm. uh, for, for many years. And so we, we did that together, uh, before I transitioned to do to working strictly with you know her her and my own brands uh, so that was something we were doing together and then on top of that we were playing in the biggest poker games in the world with these crazy chinese businessmen in a foreign country where all the best poker players from all over the world were coming out to compete in these cash games and it was kind of like the olympics mm -hmm. um and so you had this really close-knit community of poker players that would come from germany and 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 the uk and scandinavia and the us um, and so they were, we were all friends cause we had to be right. There was nothing to do there besides play poker and gamble and go out to eat. Like, so that's what we would do when we weren't playing poker and sleeping or working out, whatever we were going out to dinner. And so we, we were competitors by day and, you know, best friends at night. And so we would go out and we would also, we talked about community before I got to learn poker and s strategize with like literally all the, the big, the best online players in the world at the time and all the best live players in the world. Um, and so that made me so much better. Um, and it also just allowed me to, you know, excel and, and reach, you know, you know, really the top of the, of the high stakes cash game world um, and, and, and thrive and, 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 you know, crush those, those, those games for years. And that was, that was incredible. So, uh, you know, business was going well, like, was having incredible personal time was traveling the world got to see all these different countries um and it was just an incredible ride for four years that was um you know i will look back on those years uh if i make it to my 70s 80s uh and and, and think they were some of the most crazy and fun in my life i'm very confident about that um wow. i'd love to write a book about it yeah. one day and um kind of relive those memories again through communicating them in, in, a, in a written way that would be you know it would be worth doing sounds really awesome um and yeah do, it was special. do you do you still get out there at all like do you do a yearly trip or do you find yeah so i was there this year um yeah. in macau i was playing and coaching creating content uh it was a lot of fun um i went out to asia twice this year but i only went to macau once um but yeah it's it's great i'm not like so you know, I've been back every year since I think, um, but um, I was living there and I had an apartment there for four years. So like actually, you know, like rented a place right above across the street from the win uh, where we played poker every day and Star World where the big game was the private game. And um, yeah, I had an apartment there. I left my stuff there. I would spend, I don't know, depending on the year. Uh, and the visas and all that stuff, you know, three, five, six months a year there. Um, yeah, three, four trips a year. That was, uh, it was incredible. Cool. And, but and now I'm not, I don't have my apartment anymore. So, you know, when I go, I, you know, I stay at the Wynn or, or whatever, or the Mandarin. And, 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 you know, I'm, I'm just there more as I feel like a tourist, you know, because I'm yeah. not part of the poker scene there, even though there are still regulars that live there and that are grinding it out, like, you know, doing, doing their thing. I'm not part of that community anymore. Yeah. How do you find the these days the games and the lifestyle out there compared to say the games and the lifestyles of staying in California? Oh, I mean it's night and day. It's just totally different. So that is strictly and it, and it's probably the same now as it was when I was there um in terms of lifestyle and whatever cuz you know people still live in the same building, still the same you know, it's still the same country. There's still the same things to do, mm -hmm. but it's just totally different. You know, you, you there, you know, every day while you're there and people usually come for, you know, between two and five or six weeks, you get up at 10 AM. Um, you put your name on the list, you go work out and eat, you come back at two or three and play the game. Uh, you play till ever. And then you do it all over again. And, you know, you maybe go out to dinner or whatever um sometime during the game but that's just like your daily lifestyle you know so when you're not playing poker you're studying poker with friends you're going out to the cafes and, and talking strategy um and then when you're not doing that you're traveling around southeast asia taking some cool lifestyle trip whereas 
you know, in Southern Cali where I'm here visiting family and I'm playing on live with the bike and coaching, whatever. It's just totally different. I mean, it's just like, you know, typical American first world life. It is just so different living in the U S or living in Southeast Asia or Macau. Um, you know, people there don't speak typically you're in a different culture. So it's a different mindset, just night and day. Um, but it's specifically the poker scene here is a lot different because, you know, the poker scene here is like, you know, a lot of people are like part-time players or they play and they have their own business or they do other things. Like their life is more dynamic and involved in other things here. So, you know, when you go to the casino, it's like a part of your life. It's not your whole thing. Whereas in Macau, it's like a disproportionately large part of your time and energy and life is, is poker. Whereas in Cali or Vegas or Florida or these other poker hubs around the U S like poker is a slice of the pie. It's not the whole thing. Whereas in Macau, it's like you are a poker player and that's it. Right. And what about the the Chinese players over there? Is it also a lot of like serious pros or would they have the same dynamic where poker is a slice of the pie for them and they're mostly running businesses and yeah. Well, it depends on the level, right? So like the high stakes players are all very wealthy, unlimited money, Chinese businessmen involved in other things. Yeah. Um, but it's different in Macau because nobody lives there. So Macau is an island off the coast of Hong Kong and they changed the Chinese visa laws where now I think they only have like three days or five days. Uh, in the past they had longer, but all the VIPs that come are tourists. So they're there on vacation, right? Like I guess the closest analogy I could make is Vegas where like, you know, a guy flies in from Florida, comes to Vegas for the weekend and he's there to gamble. Mm -hmm. he's not in his daily routine but it's even more stark in macau because like nobody lives there and um uh you know gambling is so much more prominent in the in the chinese culture as well that it's just so much more uh, symbolic and ingrained in their in their daily life um but but everybody is there to gamble and that's like the focus of the trip whereas in yeah. in the u.s uh, you know, if someone goes to Vegas, typically their focus isn't gambling. It's entertainment, it's dinner, it's partying, yeah. it's all these other things. And poker and poker or gambling is, again, a slice of that whole pie. Whereas in Asian culture, if people go to Macau, especially gambling is the center of that trip. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure about the revenue split in Macau, but I know in Vegas, for example, uh, when I heard the numbers of the win, they do like $1.1 billion a year in entertainment and they do 800 million in gaming because i would mm. doubt that the revenue splits were like that in macau i would say it's much I, i'm guessing but i would say it's much higher split in terms of gaming so that just sort of changes the dynamic of of, of the life there to a large extent because the gambling is so much more important um so you're, you know a vip that sits in the in the game in macau is there to play poker. He's not going to like leave that game at seven because he's going to see a fucking Cirque du Soleil show. Like that's not going to happen, you right. know? So it's just a different sort of thing. Um, but that makes it a lot more intense. It's a lot more competitive. The VIPs really want to win. They're like, they're there to draw blood. You know, they're like in, in Vegas, someone goes to play poker. They're there to have a good time. In yeah. Macau, they go to play poker. They're there to like crush you. You know, so, I mean, they, they might not have the talent, but they're, the, the intensity of the game in Macau is so much higher because that's just like, you know, the focus, you know, it's just, an, it's like playing on another level. It's just a different experience. Yeah, I gotcha. I'm just, for some reason, I'm picturing Mortal Kombat and getting to the top two levels of the tower where you're playing the bosses. And that's, that's, what that's it's exactly like what Macau. it's like. So, suddenly the game yeah, just exactly got so like. much harder and you're just like, who is this dude? Okay. I'm yeah, you're like, this. now I've read the final boss. And it's <laughs> yeah. a lar it's largely like that when the VIP comes because sometimes the VIP is like, you know, the massive whale. And, and, and there's a huge difference between, you know, a small fish and a big fish. And, and you yeah. see that disparity exponentially greater in Macau. So like there, there'll be a VIP, he'll come and lose 200,000 Hong Kong, which is, you know, 30,000 US, whatever. But then there'll be a VIP, he'll come and lose 20 million. Whoa. You know, and so th there, there's maybe not in a day, but like over the period of, you know, a month or a year. And that's, that's the VIP that, you know, a lot of people uproot their lives and live in a different country for. And so like, there's an economy based around a couple people that are like truly, truly epic punters. Mm -hmm. And, and um, 
it's just a whole different game. And, and eventually, you know, I many, many times over, the, over those years got to play with, you know, the final boss. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, it really is like that Mortal Kombat is an unbelievably great analogy that you just made because it's very much like that where you, you you get to the final boss and you're like okay this is this is this is the big game yeah yeah and speaking of speaking of the big game i know it's not stakes wise the biggest game but in terms of kind of promotion and awareness live at the bike poker night in america these are pretty mainstream games there's a lot of action on these games and you seem to be a staple yeah. in pretty much both of them and i was kind of curious um your motivations for playing is it because they're good games is it because of the exposure is it a mix is it because you just love cash games uh what drew you to just show up on those shows as often as you seemingly possibly can well there's there's definitely all those elements right so it's not binary in the sense that like i'm only doing this for this um all those things are totally fair i obviously um you know arbitrarily starting at one of them i do feel like i have a big edge in the game so i'm gonna make i'm gonna profit i think that's a smaller motivation that's probably like my third or fourth motivation it's, it's just one of my my la least biggest motivations um just because like the effort to go play in those games and travel around to get there and like cuts into your ROI. And so I don't think about it as much from a business standpoint or a poker player standpoint. Uh, and also the effort to get in those games and coordinate and the publicity, like it's just the poker is more of a show and it's less about the ROI and, and the, and the, the, the hourly, like, I don't really think about that sort of thing, even though I won't deny that, like you said, I made 20,000 in the last couple sessions here, live the bike, that's real money. And I'm very grateful for that. And, and I'm, I, I take that seriously. Um, but the main thing playing, but that hourly you can achieve going to play at a casino that nobody knows about. Right. So there's obviously something more to playing on a televised game mm -hmm. that you don't get just your hourly, or you get something additionally to that, which I think supersedes the motivation quite a bit. Uh, and for me, you know, you touched on those, obviously one of them is just, I do have personal goals in, um, building a brand. And I think the more, you know, those things offer credibility because when you play on national television and people can see, you know, some of the, the good plays you've made and some of the good calls you've made and the folds you've made and stuff like that, uh, those hands and videos get a lot of attention. That's good for your brand. Uh, obviously I'm not going to deny that that draws people to conscious poker and they might want to buy our products and services, but, um, more, more than that, it gives me personally credibility as a poker player, which on a personal standpoint, I value more because I, I can leverage that to, you know, share things I've learned in poker that apply to life and business through keynotes or writing a book or giving a Ted talk or helping other people on their journey. And that's like more what I feel connected to as my purpose in, in life that goes beyond just my business or any of my immediate sort of um, short term goals with, with, with those sorts of superficial things that like is a vehicle to accentuate those sorts of long term goals. So like the more that you're exposed in the public, the more you're getting your brand out there, the more you're, you're credi credible, the more leverage you have to get on other things that help you pivot to other industries and niches that I want to eventually be a, a part of, like the, the keynote world or, or a podcast or um, writing a book, those sorts of things. And obviously building a brand helps gives you all those opportunities. So I, I look at it more like from that standpoint. Um, and that's my biggest motivation by far is, is that particular one. And then underneath that are like, okay, the far more ancillary benefits of like, okay, someone's going to see that and be like, oh, I want to buy this guy's product or, oh, I'm going to make 500 or a thousand, whatever, 500 an hour, depending on the size of the game. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to think about it, whatever it is per hour playing poker. Um, sure. Those things are valuable. Um, but those are ancillary benefits. Um, but I do love playing. And I guess the other motivation that I don't get often that I would say is my second motivation is that um, I love competing and I'm mainly a high stakes cash game player. Uh, I don't, um, and, and, and poker is sort of a continuum when you play cash games, there isn't that prestigiousness that is drawn towards any cash game. Sure, in Macau in the big game, I felt that, and which is why I loved it so much. You get that thrill of like, I'm at the final table, right? Yeah. You feel that. You're like, yeah. this is more significant than the final table. You know, you're playing for millions of dollars uh, in, in, in every hand or, or potentially. Um, so 
you feel that prestige and you feel that level of competition rise where you're really having to rise to the occasion of not just playing poker like training, but you're playing as a performance. Mm -hmm. And when you're on TV um, or, or streamed game or something like that, you're really doing that, right? Because it's creating this atmosphere of competition where the stakes have been raised just because of the fact that it's on national television. And so that brings out the best in everyone or the opportunity to perform your best. And that is, it feels to me like I'm showing up on game day for the playoffs, whereas everything else is just the regular season. And so I don't get that thrill often, but when I play, you know, in a high stakes televised game where I know the whole world's watching, I feel that like now I'm at the playoffs and I have to perform and show up and that's exciting to me. And so that those two things, you know, building a personal brand behind it and then performing in the best of my capacity is really what distinguishes those games from anything else. Wow. I love that. I love that. Thank you. Um, one of the things I was, I was curious about was if you feel extra pressure and how you deal with it, but hearing what you said already is you, you thrive on that. You want that, you crave that. And you're someone who rises to the occasion because you want the higher stakes, whereas other people might get nervous about them. Um, and yeah, with, I get more excited yeah. um, in that environment for sure. And do you feel too, because I know you do commentary as well, like in some of the early shows, you do call-ins where people could ask you about hands. Do you feel that's yet another opportunity for you to kind of, like, it's not play, but you're still kind of on the playoffs because now tons of people are hearing your breakdown of the game and it better be sharp. Do you feel that's another kind of way that you get to rise to the occasion and get to kind of kind of use all your performance skills and your acting skills and demonstrate your knowledge uh, in front of a big audience where, you know, for most people aren't going to volunteer and do that commentary game. Yeah. So I'm actually doing commentary this Thursday on Live of the Bike. And uh, I, I think I'm playing Friday in the, the big game. But um, it's cool to do the commentary because you get to interact with the fans. So, like, I the commentary is okay. Like, mm -hmm. sure, you get to talk about poker strategy and whatever. But, like, for me, I'm a people person. So I'm I, like... I do the commentary so that after the, the commentary uh, I take live call-ins and I can answer questions that people have because I feel like, okay, I'm connecting with others and yeah. maybe they have a question that they've been wanting to ask me and I could help them on their journey somehow, or they can like get the perspective that is, would be really cool to have. And I remember um, when I was uh, 18, I was in the Bahamas and I was sitting at the bar and Freddie Deeb came over and sat down next to me and he had just won the commerce WPT for a million dollars. So, you know, he was already obviously a famous player, but now he was like, you know, super legend. And, uh, I was starstruck and I was 18 and I was there and I, I was just like, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm alone at a bar with Freddie Deeb. Like this is so, I didn't even know what to say. So cool. And so I think he like, maybe he clearly noticed me or maybe saw that I was like, just wanted to talk to him, whatever. And so he just was like, super friendly. It just started talking to me. He's like, Hey, how you doing? Uh, you know, you're here for the tournament. How's your event going? Like just started talking to me. And then, um, he put my drink on his tab and he's like, you know, I got it. Right. And I just thought it was like the coolest thing ever. Cause like, yeah. here I am like looking up to this guy and he was just so nice and cool to me. And I remember I told him about a situation at the, the, the tournament where I got short on chips and what do I do? And he gave me some advice, which, you know, still stuck with me to this day. Um, and I just remember thinking, like, if I'm ever the Freddie Deeb to somebody else, like, I want to, I want them to feel the way I felt around Freddie, you know. So I want to be like as cool as Freddie was to me, because this was like one of the coolest yeah. experiences I've had with someone that I thought was like a, you know, someone I looked up to. Yeah. And I've had other experiences that were the opposite, and I don't want to name names, but that I just completely was like disappointed with and let down by, yeah. and so. I, I feel like if I, you know, if I can do that, if I can offer that to someone in any way, like I would, I, I'm, it's always stuck with me. And so like, I, I like doing things like that where I can connect with other people like call-ins or whatever. Um, and I always try and like interact with all my fans on social media mm -hmm. and do things like that, even though it's not on the performance stage, mm -hmm. just because I, 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 you know, am compelled by that. But, um, yeah, I love doing the commentary and the call-ins. That's like really cool. It's a good way to like interact with people in a way that you otherwise couldn't. 
and um and then it's it's a rewarding experience in a different way than playing yeah and i think you hit on a really almost magical kind of point there um with your story about freddie deeb i love that story that when when you get advice or a favor or attention or anything from anyone you look up to it's worth like 100x um what it would be if you got that attention or that feedback or that advice from anyone else so if you can become someone that people really respect and look up to and they kind of see you as a role model and want to be like you then you give them one minute of attention and that's worth maybe 10 hours of attention from other places and that message is going to really stick and they're going to hold that to their heart so it's amazing how now that you're in this position you've you've really worked hard for it you you've deserved it you've earned it you you really live you practice what you preach and you live that truth that now you can give someone one minute of time five minutes of time and it's going to have a huge impact on you know years and years and years of their lives so it's 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 cool how you can kind of leverage your service that way yeah exactly exactly right like you're you're giving small amounts of time but like maybe it could have a big impact like i remember that conversation with freddie it wasn't like it wasn't like we went on a retreat together like we talked for five minutes at the bar but like i i still tell that story like i still remember the conversation i remember the feeling i had i remember the advice he gave me and like um there's a great quote by maya angelo is like people won't remember what you did or what you said, but they, they'll remember how you made them feel. I'm, I'm butchering the quote, but like, mm-hmm. it's so true. And like that feeling could happen in, you know, a minute. Yeah. It could happen in five minutes. Like it could happen in such a small amount of time. And like, you know, it's an opportunity to like, just have a massive, like, you know, like a, like on a small scale, just like do something good or pay something forward on a small scale that could have a big impact. That's just like, you know, something that you could offer, right? Like it's not, it's not every day you have the opportunity to be, but you always have the opportunity to be kind to other people, but it's not always the opportunity you have to, to, to influence someone in a positive way in that, in that, in that regard. And so I take that responsibility really seriously. And I'm like always grateful that, you know, that someone like wants my perspective on something. And mm-hmm. so I, I try and take that seriously. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, um, it's kind of like charity. Like when you get to a point, if you're very financially abundant, and wealthy in life and you can, you know, an extra hundred dollars isn't going to make a huge difference for you, but it could make a huge difference for someone else that by donating that money to a charity, you're almost turning like lead into gold in doing so because it's the same resource. It's the same hundred dollars, but in their hands, it's worth so much more than in your hands because of that law of diminishing returns. And the same with kind of knowledge and experience, you might be offering a tip that to you, you know, it's, it's just a casual tip. It's no big deal, but that tip is going to shift everything for them. Like you said, with your mentors earlier, you know, with Tom and Andrew, like that kind of thing and sharing with each other, people are giving off stuff that they don't think is a huge deal, but for the person who hasn't learned it yet, it's everything. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Real beautiful. Stuff. Yeah. So, so I'm talking sure you're about, in that spot too. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Like, well, actually, that's something that was really interesting is I felt that I was in that spot for quite some time. And then I just kind of got caught up in the rush, caught up in the high, chasing numbers, made some of the not the best decisions. And then I kind of humbled myself and I'm like, okay, I need to stop making content for a bit. I need to check myself and I, I, and I need to honor where I am because it's what you said. I, I realized I had an audience. I realized there were some people who looked up to me and there were some people who, you know, wanted to hear what I had to say. But when I realized I kind of let my ego get the best of me, uh, I was making some poor decisions and I wasn't living right. I didn't feel that it was right for me to go on camera and speak and give advice when I was in that place. So I said, okay, I'm going to take, you know, as long as it takes, whether it's six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, I'm going to get myself right. And when I feel like I actually have something of value to give, where I'm going to share things with people that are actually going to have a positive impact rather than a negative impact because I'm coming from the right place, then I'll come back. But until then, I have to respect the fact that there are people who look up to me and I don't want to tell them things that aren't going to serve them because people listen really strongly to what the role models say the same way we usually hold on to what our parents say to us at a young age. And and they don't even realize like how 
how much we held on to this one little yeah. thing the one time they got mad because when it's, it's that person you look up to it's just like oh my god like it just it, it sticks with us so much so i i feel it's really important to just honor and yeah, respect that and i can so tell you're true. someone who who really lives it and so it's, yeah, it's easy for I, you to I really show up and, be conscious of things that i say or advice i give and stuff because you just never know like where someone's at or what they're gonna yeah. take or like it's hard because you know it's hard because like you know you want to say like oh do this or whatever but like i try and phrase things like this works for me you know because like it's so individual with with anything right mm -hmm. with advice or with routine or with habit or lifestyle that um i try to take that responsibility seriously i'm sure i make mistakes uh, i'm sure of that but um you know it's it's the intention that i think is important and it sounds like you have that too which is which is great man good for you a lot of respect thank you um and some something i know that that you're into and i think a lot of the up-and-comers they get pointed the wrong direction with tournaments because they're very excited they're exciting there's the adrenaline rush they're very glamorized and so a lot of people think oh i should i want to play tournaments i want to get rich quick kind of the lottery mentality yeah i came up through cash games yeah. I know you came up through cash games too, and you focus on cash games now. Um, can you just talk a bit about why, even though they don't have the glitz and glamour, that you really think they're the better way and why you chose them as you know, your path for the most part? Well, I mean, if you just look at the numbers, so so one of the things I do with my, um, my clients is we kind of develop like a, a business plan for them in their poker journey, because a lot of them, come to me and they're like, well, I want to, you know, make uh, like whatever, 5k a month on the side playing poker while I run my business. And, 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 you know, I, they might have a hypothesis that like, you know, I, I want to play tournaments and this is, this is what I enjoy doing and whatever. And then when we break down the numbers, you know, I'm very practical. And so I, I go into the numbers and I show them the variance involved and the bankroll they need and the, the amount of swings they could expect, the the big blinds that they can expect to win, their hourly rate. And uh, we sort of reverse engineer it. And I show them like two business models. And I say, look, this is if you only play cash games. You know, this is what you need to do. And this is your variance. This is your probability of loss after a year. Um, and those numbers are very compelling. If they're a winning player, the probability of loss is always, you know, almost zero after a year, depending on how many hours they play and how, how of a winner they are. Um, the bankroll they need is much smaller. The variance is lower. Their win rate is higher. Their hourly is higher, et cetera. Then I show them the same business plan with the corresponding tournaments that they want to play. And the variance is five times higher. The, the, the bankroll they need is bigger. The, the, the hourly is smaller. The probability of winning is smaller. Everything is just objectively a lot worse, like exponentially worse, not, not, not like slightly worse. You know, we're talking about like extremely worse and so when you see the numbers on paper um you know anyone that's that has a that, that that is focused on the numbers and the business and and making it a lifestyle uh is always um, my experience almost always drawn to cash games because of the math and then they just allow you to succeed in that way and poker is already look we're already talking about something that is gambling there's a ton of variance there's a lot of luck uh in the short term and when you amplify that by playing a format of poker like tournaments, uh, you know, skill may not be the deciding factor in terms of whether you're a winner or a loser in a given year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a given year. And most people, when they see those numbers and we, we talk about, I'm very you know, strict about them allocating money um, segregated in a separate bank account to poker that's non uh lifestyle related and that is completely discretionary and most people you know that that come to me that want to work with me that they're, they're serious about doing this they have lofty financial goals they want to dedicate you know 10 20 50 000 to poker and they see where that i mean these people are you know successful businessmen they're, they're investors they do well in in their in their business and their lives they, they, they see where the 50k is potentially going to end up in a tournament business plan or they see where it's going to end up in a cash game business plan they're much more compelled by those sorts of things. And, and, and that that's what I teach now based on, you know, my experience of what I've learned over the past 15 years in doing this. Um, and again, teaching it has made it so much more um, obvious to me than it was when I knew it sort of intuitively growing up in poker where I didn't have these, these resources and I didn't go through it as methodically, but then forcing myself to do it 
for others and helped me get better at doing it myself and really creating my own sort of business plan out of necessity when I started playing a lot of the higher stakes cash games in Macau where I was like, you know, needing to be more cognizant of, uh, you know, where the, the risk involved and then coupling that with, you know, the high stakes tournaments. I was playing the 100Ks for a year or two around um, different places around the world and in Monaco, Barcelona, St. Kitts. And just really going through the numbers and realizing like, wow, um, you know, I always win in cash games and tournaments is, is, is a little bit more of lottery where, you know, two of the numbers. Um, it, it's just so much more compelling. Not to say there isn't edge in tournaments, right? Your EV is still high. It's just your variance is so high that the time you need to, you know, sort of guarantee you're going to be a winner or outlast the variance is just too high for most uh, players that are recreational and even a lot of professionals because they have to that money is practical for them they have to pay bills with it or they have you know they want to make investments with it or they want to use it for something and so that's you know it, it's basically it comes down to the numbers which is why i think cash games are just so compelling yeah. uh for professional yeah i i agree and and a couple other things i really like about cash games is when you're playing a cash game you're in full control you choose when you start you choose when you stop. If you're feeling off that day, you can quit early in the session. You can eat when you want to. You can choose what stakes you're playing that day, move up and down accordingly, choose the table you want, choose the, the table you want. you want. There are yeah. so many things that you have control over that impact your win rate greatly. Whereas tournaments, you're basically signing everything over to whoever's running the event. You're adhering to their schedule which might vary each day, what time you finish playing, what time you take your dinner break. You have no idea what table you're going to get seated on, whether it's going to be a good table draw or a bad one. And you have to play higher stakes as the day goes on. So you're going to get more tired and the stakes are going to get higher and you're going to feel more pressure. And it, it, it's really just hilarious how they have this structure where the stakes get higher. So your adrenaline gets taken to the max at the end of the day. And then you're expected to be able to go to bed and wake up on very little sleep to play the next day. Like, it, it's just a format. I mean, that makes everyone, it... everyone undergoes the same thing. So, yeah. I mean, it is sort of fair. And I understand the lure of tournaments. I'm Believe me, I'm compelled by them too. I love the com competitive nature. I love the, the, uh, the stakes that a tournament creates with this life and death sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I'm compelled by the idea of investing 10,000 in the main event and winning 8 million, uh, you know, all those things, I, I feel those things too, emotionally. I'm not, you know, privy to these sorts of things. Uh, but, but, um, you know, when you, when you think about it from a lifestyle and a business plan, um, you know, it's just cash games are just so compelling. If you have the, the talent for them, I think, uh, it just makes so much more sense. Your, your hourly is just going to be so much higher with so much more consistency that it's hard to justify, the opportunity cost of playing a lot of tournaments. Yeah, I think also um, expenses are generally going to be lower with cash than tournaments. Totally. But also, some one thing I really realized because in 2013 I decided I wanted to go for tournaments because I wanted to experience that same rush that I vicariously yeah. experienced through Greggy, and it took me about three years to get it. And I got a big score and I got the rush. I'm like, oh, okay, this is what it's all about, and. While I was studying it and watching, you know, my mentors for tournament play and seeing how much stress they were under and seeing like the emotional strain of it and then feeling it myself, I'm like, even if the money was slightly better, the amount of stress it places on the body and the kind of unpredictability of the emotions again, taking a highs and disappointments Mindset. from beats People and stuff. People underestimate that. It, it just, it eats away at you so much that it's, I think it's really hard to stay healthy um, unless, you know, you, you have your, you, you piece yourself out perfectly and you have a structure, you know, everything you're going to play. And even still, it's very volatile emotionally, um, that I think is people don't realize how taxing it's going to be on them. It's so much more to manage too. I mean, if you're managing pieces and business, it's just a disaster. Um, and then, and then also like people, people struggle when they go on downswings in cash games, yeah. but like the, the, the amount of stress you're going to place on yourself by going on downswings and tournaments is like 10 X that, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just like people underestimate their ability to play well while losing. And so all these things that you discussed, like that you mentioned in, in, in your chat with me just now, and these sorts of things where like um, the mentality, like how are those things going to affect your ability to play your a game 
next time. Whereas in cash games, it's easier to play your A game consistently. Mm -hmm. And then you play your A game more consistently, your win rate is better, which thereby increases the gap in variance and win rate and hourly between tournaments and cash games even further. And those are things that are like hard to quantify that people underestimate. Um, and so all these things just compound to make, I think cash games just a clear choice for a long-term poker strategy. Yeah. Okay. So talking about cash yeah. games, talking about, you know, playing, playing your best, your a game, feeling good, playing better poker and just being a better poker player. Um, I've got the Conscious Poker website up. So I just kind of swapped your camera for the Conscious Poker website. So people are oh, kind of kind of seeing it. Can you talk about um you've talked to you've talked a little bit about what there is at Conscious Poker. We've talked about the courses, the membership, and the coaching. But can you talk about um, you know, the easiest way for people to get involved in it and you know what they can expect if you know they come on board for say a month versus three months versus a year kind of thing? Great question. So let's start at the beginning. The easiest way to get involved is just check out the site and you could just enter your email free and you can get the hand reading system that I described briefly described here in an email. And there's a, there's a PDF that I'll send you um, again, it's totally free that, that, uh, describes kind of how to think about hand reading. And, and, and I focus on hand reading because I, th I think it's one of my better skills, but I think it's also one of the most important skills to have in poker, because if you can figure out what other people have, uh, you, you, you can outplay them. You know, the sky is sort of the limit, right? Like that is the ultimate skill. It's what you're trying to do every single hand. It's the puzzle you're trying to solve is to figure out what the hell does my opponent have and mm -hmm. what do I do with that information, right? That's sort of step two. Uh, but this is the, the, the first sort of thing you need to figure out in order to, to increase your win rate at poker. And so I made that system available um, free as a PDF. Um, and uh, there are some options when you opt in to take a look at some more uh, premium content. We have like an upgraded hand reading system version, uh, which is $8 if you want it. If not, totally no pressure. Um, no pressure about that as well. There's some courses in there and some videos that walk you through the program as well. Um, and then obviously we have a blog that's totally free where I produce like some like 10 page blog content about a subject. So there's one about bet sizing strategy, which is what I believe is like the, the best piece of free content about that subject. It's like literally a 10 page blog post about everything you need to know about bet sizing strategy or mastering the heart of hand reading the, the post I told you about before with my process or just cash game poker strategy or tournament poker strategy. Um, mm -hmm. there's all those things that are in depth on the blog. And again, that's, that's, Totally free content as well. Um, so check those things out. Um, and then, like, the membership is meant to be um, taken uh, linear. So there are courses when you join the membership that you take in order. And uh, you'll start with Mastering Poker Math, where you'll take a course on uh, all the things poker math related. And then after that, there's Hand Reading Foundation, which really goes over that four-step process in detail uh, about all the things you need to know about hand reading and like walks you through exactly how to implement that. And then there's a library of videos where there's like 90 or hundred videos uh, that are broken down by category. Uh, and it's really useful because there's like a little filtering system. So let's say you're like, Oh, I really want to work on three betting strategy. You just click the drop down menu and click on three bet. And you can sort by all the videos that talk about three betting strategy. And then some of the videos have worksheets too, to help you kind of implement what you learned um, as well. And so in the videos, they're, they're more in depth than the YouTube videos where I go into, you know, poker cruncher and I show you, I walk you through the lab of like EV and those sorts of things that I don't really have time to talk about, or, or they're not really formatted correctly for YouTube. Uh, they're much more in depth. Um, and I would say in the membership, we have some great, testimonials and feedback from people that that have that have joined and that have seen great results um and i mean the way i think about it is like you know the membership uh is 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 there's a free trial first of all so you have no risk you just try it out for free for 14 days if you don't absolutely love it or don't feel like it's worth twice what you're you're going to pay for it just just cancel it's totally fine i don't want people to pay for something that they don't feel like they believe in uh, or they they find value for and that's something that we we changed as, a, as an approach to, to the business model because we were like, you know, if people try, like we want people to try our product, right? Because we believe like if someone tries our product, they're going to be compelled 
to stay on board because they're going to see the value that we're offering. So that's why I give away the handwriting system for free. That's why we have a blog and YouTube and all these things because it's like if people see content and, and the free content is helping them, then they're going to be like, oh, well, I'm, it's, it's a no brainer to pay for this paid content that is structured in that way. And the way I think about it, you know, our membership is 49 a month. If you make, you know, one good decision, let's say you play, you know, one, three, no limit. Uh, if you make, you know, one good decision in a month because of something you learned, then then the content's going to pay for itself, even even twofold, right? I mean, $100 is not that much at one, three, you could win, you know, two, 3,000 a month in that game, 5,000. Um, so, you know, if you make one good decision, you're going to double the amount of money you're investing in the program. It just feels like a no-brainer, and we wanted to structure it that way so that it, it just it just uh, was 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 a, a a worthwhile purchase for en- for anyone that was serious about poker. And so we always try to make sure they're getting twice what they're paying, and that's one of the goals that we have at, uh, as a brand. Um, so that's a little bit more about how to get involved. Uh, obviously, um, you know, for me personally, I'm like very uh, responsive to everyone. I always look for feedback and how to improve things. So you can always just hit the contact page and send me an email that goes directly to me. I read all my email. Um, So if you want to contact me about anything through Conscious Poker, that's a great way to get in touch or just on social as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. man. I got to tell you, your new site looks really good, man. Thank you. It looks really good. I remember the first iteration and the second and the third. And this one, like... Props to the team. Pass on props to the whole team, dude. Everything looks really, yeah. really good. Well done. Thank you. We got some A players working with us. Graph, all the graphics are original. Great graphic designer. I worked closely with the web designer um, to help out. My my wife did. All, she's great at design, and she did all like the in- intuition and the layout. We actually just redid the membership uh, in March, and it's like the layout is incredible. It's like so intuitive. It is just like these neat little drop down menus where you can sort by like cash game or tournaments yeah. or pre flop strategy or post flop strategy or whatever you want to learn. Um, there's hashtags, so you can click on a hashtag and all the videos with that subject will populate. Um, there's recommended videos based on your watching preferences. Um, there's some really cool stuff in there to just make your user experience very intuitive and, and you know valuable. Um, so thank you for that. But we're that's something we we put a lot of attention into as well. Yeah, I, I can also see now why kind of you didn't rush to bring other people on board because by the sounds of it, you kind of didn't need to. You you had the knowledge that you needed. You you knew what you needed to teach people to make them good players. You had the vision and you didn't need to complicate it or dilute it by having to cater to other people's needs. You're just kind of like, I got this. And once once the foundation's super, super solid, maybe bring on some support players, but right. you kind of had it and you just needed to see it through. Uh, to bring it where yeah, it is like, now. Like I needed to put in the work before I just started to outsource that. I mean, it's like, by the time I, like, like I could create a strategy video quicker than I could explain to another coach the strategy video I want them to create, you know? So yeah. it's like, I have so many more courses in the pipeline that I want to bring into the membership and things and concepts that I want to teach that I feel like until I've kind of taught the, all the things that I want to teach, I'm still going to like do it. And then when I feel like burnt out from this, um, or I feel like, okay, you know, I've produced all the content that I want and I feel like I'm kind of a hamster on a wheel again, just sort of like saying the same things, or I don't really have any more courses I want to create or products. Then I could bring in, you know, someone else that's like, Hey, I want to share it this way or, you know, whatever. So I'm still kind of exploring, uh, this stage of my own, on my own journey. And it's, uh, it's, it's really fun. I'm actually going back to Italy in a, in a month and I have a new course I'm going to build for the membership that I'm really excited about. And I'm going to be releasing that in the membership soon. Um, so each month that you're a member, you get a new course. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to be putting that out as well, hopefully in October. And, um, I'm excited about it, you know, so like I'm, th- these things still yeah. excite me to build yeah. these, this content. And it's like I said, follow your, you know, you follow your sort of effort and excitement in, in, in life to kind of understand your trajectory. And so as long as I'm still like, compelled by going back in the lab and creating that new course and producing an amazing product, um, I'm going to just, you know, keep going. Yeah. I, I, I dig it, man. Um, Thanks. Follow, Thanks. Thanks a lot. Follow the passion. When 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 you're loving the grind of poker, play poker. When you're loving teaching, do teaching. If you fall out yeah. of love with either of those things, sit and be like, what makes me happy? What is it that I stopped doing that I really enjoyed? And when that thing comes to mind, do that for a day. 
and see if see if that's enough to bring you on path to make more content or if it's oh maybe i need to pivot and being in that joyful state will kind of open the creative pathways to see what's possible i um, love that that's great great yeah. uh summary perspective there yeah cool so i've got i've got your website on screen i've got your youtube channel is conscious poker now i've got your instagram and twitter alec torelli that's where people should follow you at yeah um, for sure. I'm very active on social. I, you know, read, respond to all my comments. Um, definitely hit me up if, you know, you're on there. Say, hey, say, tell me you found me here. Or if you have questions, uh, reach out. Cool. And people know about the free membership. So, you know, guys, head on over to ConsciousPoker.com. Sign up. See what you think of the content. You're probably going to really enjoy it. If you stayed around for this long in the conversation, you're definitely going to stick yeah. around for the membership and like what you get there. Um, yeah, for Al sure. Alec, is there... I mean, first, I just want to say I really appreciate you um, making the time. It's amazing how how when I'm like, all right, I'm ready to do this. You're like, cool, let's do it in two days. How quickly you made it happen. So um, <laughs> ma massive gratitude for doing that and showing up and coming through. This has been a lot of fun. Is, Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. For sure. My pleasure. Is there anything you want to you know, leave the um, aspiring poker players out there with? Any words of wisdom or advice you'd like to share to the maybe the younger generation? Yeah, just to really be aware of what it is that you actually want and reverse engineer to get that. So a lot of people are like compelled by the poker lifestyle or they're like, oh, I'm, you know, I like poker, therefore I want to play professionally full time. And it's like mm -hmm. it, it doesn't necessarily work that way. Like the lifestyle of a professional poker player might not work for anyone. And just because you know, you, you can make money doing it doesn't mean that that's what you should do for your life. Uh, and, but maybe it does, but I, I have a lot of people come to me in DMS and I'm like, Oh, I want to play poker. You know, I could make this much money doing it. I want to, I want to do that. And it's like, have a plan, really think this out, really think this through, set aside money that you can totally afford to lose, uh, in a segregated bank account where your living expenses are covered. And if you want to go for it, go for it. But then really try and understand like the place that you want poker to fit in your life and what your sort of niche is within poker, what your sort of skill is, what you enjoy doing, whether you want to play, you know, online tournaments or live cash games. I mean, it's just so different, right? There's all these sort of like micro economies within poker. Mm -hmm. um, and then just aware of like how that changes over time and that um, what you started out aspiring to and, and, trying to get to might not be what you want in a couple of years. And so to think about sort of the long-term play of it, my general experience. And I, I, you know, say this as someone that's like sort of quote made it in poker and that mm -hmm. sells poker and that coaches poker is that most people, again, you can't apply like stereotypes to everything is like most people would be better off playing poker part-time and having another source of income or doing something else as their primary thing. And I think it's great to be able to play poker, but it's not great to have to play poker. And it's hard to get above the point where you're sort of like above the bullshit, where the money that you make playing poker doesn't really affect your life. You have to be playing pretty high stakes to do that. And it's quite hard to get to that ceiling. And typically, if you have a skill set that can get you to that level in poker you have a skill set that could also make you more money not that it's only about the money but that it could it could it could bring more value doing something else with a lot less stress and a lot more consistency and so i would say that it's great to be able to make money playing poker you should have a business plan you should be responsible um try you know maybe make two to five k a month on the side is is the sweet spot i think for most people and i think that's what most people should strive for um whereas doing it professionally is its own entire thing yeah. um that that's been my experience I, and again i'm saying that like as someone that's been a professional for a long time and I, and i still feel that way so i feel compelled to share that because um yeah it is it is uh what i find that works best for most people the balance yeah I, I agree with you completely and I really appreciate the honesty you share with myself yeah. and with all the viewers. Um, okay, so thanks to everyone who tuned in today. I hope Thank you guys, guys 
enjoy enjoy the podcast and you know learned a lot and um alec i look forward to seeing you for the next one i'm sure we'll have another one of these conversations down the road as well as things continue yeah. to evolve uh so guys After check I'm out the 2020 main event i'm coming 20, back 2020 main event there it's going to be 10 million dollars let's get stacking uh i'm evan jarvis guys this has been alec torelli for uh conscious poker.com check them out on youtube and on the socials and um you guys know what to do take what you learned go out there and get stacking